Okay, good morning. Oh, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. All right. How is everybody? Good. Good. Very good. Uh, we're at the halfway point. I know. I told you it goes quick. Yeah. After today, we're half done. Just a week today. Yeah. It's already been two weeks. Yeah. I yeah. Know. Two weeks after graduation. The, yeah. the one week from now. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I wasn't here Monday. I was on Monday. <laughs> yeah, it goes really quick. Really quick. So you guys had chapter four. Good morning. You had chapter four um, homework. Did everybody read the chapter and take the test in the white book and grade it? Everybody grade it? Yeah. Okay, when I call your name, let me know how many you missed or what your grade is. The grading scale is at the bottom of that um, answer page. Bren? Thank you. Nadia? Lauren? Thank you. Erasima? Thank you. I'm about to thank just a second right now. Joanna? Rosina? Thank you. Rosina, do you have chapter one for no, me? I have just... No, no worries. No worries. Damwanti? Thank you. Mariah? Thank you. Caitlin? Thank you. Joni? Gabrielle? Gabrielle, do you have two and three for me? Thank you. Thank you. Erica, do you have two, three, and four for me? Okay. Joni got one wrong. Okay, thank you. Erica, I need two, three, and four if you uh, have those fours. If not, I'll get them from you next week. So Joni missed one. Okay, and Amy? Thank you. All right, anybody have any questions on chapter four? Any questions? I was curious about the... Um... Is it called ostomy? Ostomy. ostomy. Okay. okay, so let me explain to you what an ostomy is. And we'll use this guy over here for demonstration. So in your body, you have, I'm going to fix that real quick. It's zoomed in a little too far. 
That's the one feature I can't control from over there. There we go, that's better. Okay. So, our bodies have um, several body systems and they're all individual. They do a different job, but they're all interconnected, right? So you have your lymphatic system, nervous system, cardiovascular system, respiratory, endocrine, urinary, integumentary, reproductive, and gastrointestinal is the one we're going to talk about right now. So the gastrointestinal, it um, is comprised of all of your digestive organs, your stomach, your gallbladder, um, your intestines, all of that. And let's say that we have a problem with one of our intestines and the stool can't get out by itself. Okay. So either we had um, a tumor or we've got diverticulitis or there's a lot of reasons why that could happen. But for some reason, the stool, and, and we all have to go, right, routinely, you can't leave all that stuff inside because it can make you sick, right? So that's why we have bowel movements. So if that can't come out of the body naturally, then what we would do is create a little hole somewhere and we would divert that intestine to the hole. So instead of the stool coming out of your uh, rectum, where it normally does, it would just come out of a hole somewhere on the body. Now, where we have the exit is going to depend on where the problem is. So if our problem is really low, then our, we might um, exit this intestine really low on the front abdomen, okay? If the problem is way up higher, then the hole may be more up here. So ostomy placement is going to change depending on what caused us to have that surgery to begin with. Does that make sense? So that surgical opening, right? Creating a hole to the outside world and connecting the intestine to that hole is called an ostomy. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Now, there's two different kinds though. And this is kind of important for you to understand. There's one for the large intestine. That's the part here that kind of goes around, right? The large intestine. If our um, ostomy is in the large intestine, we call it a colostomy, C-O-L for colon, because our large intestine is our colon. Good, makes sense, right? So if the hole is in the large intestine, then it's a colostomy that stool is going to be a little bit closer to what you would normally have normally, right? So similar consistency, color, odor, all the same stuff because the stool has gone through most of the same process. It just came out a little bit different uh, place. Good. But if we have to have, if we have to bypass that large intestine completely and go further up the digestive system, now we're into the small intestine. Now, if we're doing this with the small intestine, if we're cutting the colon completely out, right? We, we don't have, you know, we're, we're, we're interrupting the system before it even gets to the colon. If we're cutting the colon completely out, then the stool that's gonna come out is not going to be normal consistency, color, odor. It's gonna be more liquid, more acidic, because the, the stool hasn't finished its travel, right? It, di it didn't finish its journey. So we didn't have the large intestine to pull out all that excess water. That makes sense? So if you've got a colostomy somewhere in the large intestine, it can be anywhere here. It can be up this side, across, down. Colostomy can be anywhere here because it depends on where we have to interrupt the travel. 
that's going to be more normal. If it's the inside area, this is called an ileostomy, then this is going to be more liquid and more acidic. So we're going to have more skin issues with our patients. We also could have more dehydration and more um, nutrient deficits because the stool isn't going through the large intestine, which helps finish that process. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, you don't need to know what the patient's at risk for. That's the nurse's job. Remember that assessment, real problems and potential problems. So as a nurse, I have to know all this and think it through so that I can make sure that we don't have any of those potential problems while the patient is um, dealing with this issue. So what is a CNA responsibility when there is an ostomy? Well, mainly your responsibility is to empty the bag, you know, clean the bag. So it's just like, our responsibility is to help the patient to the bathroom to have a bowel movement if they need it, right? So this way, they're not going to the bathroom to have a bowel movement. It's coming out into a bag, but we're responsible for cleaning and emptying the bag. No big deal, really. The bags go on wafers. So there's a wafer that sticks to the skin and it has like a raised lip on it. And the bag attaches to it similar to, and the only way I can describe this is a Tupperware. So imagine if you put the Tupperware lid on your belly and the bag would attach to it like a bowl attaches to a lid. Okay, that makes sense? So it, it just snaps on. It's nothing to be concerned about, nothing to be scared of. It just snaps in place. Now the wafer, which is what kind of holds the, the ridge that we're gonna attach the bag to, that you can be trained, you can be. It's not a CNA function right out of the box. You can be trained to change that wafer. It's not a hard job, really. But remember I said the further up you go, the more liquid the stool becomes and the more skin issues you're gonna have. Well, if we're working with really liquid stool that's got a lot of acid in it, we want to clean that area really, really good to make sure that we're not trapping that acid against the skin where it can eat it. So usually colostomy wafers, I will train CNAs to change, but it's patient specific because everyone's a little bit different. If it's an ileostomy, liquid stool, the nurse would, would do it, okay? So when it comes to colostomy, we have to go back to this principle. CNAs do normal. Now remember that throughout your entire career because that's gonna determine what can be delegated to you. CNAs do normal. So routine tasks on a stable patient according to the care plan. So it's gotta be routine. It's gotta be a stable patient and not require any surprises, right? You can't en encounter any surprises when you do this pill. And it has to be ordered on the care plan. You can't decide, hey, I think that needs to be changed. I'll go ahead and change it, right? Mm -hmm. So those three things have to be in place. Now, as a nurse, I'm gonna figure out when something is suitable to be delegated. If it's not a routine task, I can't delegate it. If it's not a pa stable patient, if I think something might happen during the, the skill that I'm gonna have to come up with a solution for, I can't delegate it. Good, make sense? So colostomy care is generally patient specific. So that's why you don't really learn it in CNA training because I can tell you generals, your book is telling you generals, but that's not really gonna help you much because every patient is gonna require something just a little bit different. There's a million different types of bags and wafers. I mean, every manufacturer has got their own. They all work just a little bit differently. So we can't train you on millions of different pieces of equipment. So you would have to get trained by the nurse for that specific patient with that specific brand of 
whatever they're using and know exactly what to do in that specific circumstance. That's why it's patient specific training. It's not a one size fits all. Okay. Patients also a lot of times have um, preferences. Okay. Some people adapt to colostomy super easy. They're like, okay, this is now a part of my life. I can deal with it. It's all right. Other patients, not so much. They really struggle with this. And um, a lot of patients will want it cleaned out immediately. Immediately. I don't want to carry this bag around with me. As soon as there's something in it, you got to do something with it. Other patients are like, yeah, once a day is good. So we have some patient preferences here as well, right? Some patients are going to want the bag cleaned out with vinegar. Some patients will want it cleaned out with mouthwash because of odor. So we've got some other issues that, you know, will we'll determine how we're going to do this skill. And that's why it's patient specific training. Good. Questions? When I say vinegar, I'm talking about a diluted white vinegar mix. So half white vinegar, half water, you put it in the bag, you shake it up and you dump it out and it helps. It actually helps remove the stool from inside the bag, but it also helps um, with odor as well. And, and uh, vinegar has an antibacterial property to it. So it, you know, it can, can help. Um, one thing to understand though, about um, ostomies and colostomies in particular, is that the bag doesn't get thrown away each time. It's not like, a lot of people think of the bag like a diaper. When you put a diaper on a baby, it gets soiled, you throw it away. We generally, unless your patient is really, really well off and can afford it, we generally don't throw the bags away every single time they use them. We clean them, we empty them and clean them, and then we reuse them because those bags are expensive. So um, again, you'll, you'll go by your training for that particular patient. Good. Does that help you? Yeah. You're welcome. So what I want you to know about this, and again, there's not a lot of um, questions on the state exam about this. It's not gonna ask you, what uh, is the endocrine system made up of? You don't need to know that. that that's not a CNA thing. It's nice to know. If you guys are going on for nursing, it would be helpful to know. But they're going to cover all that in anatomy and physiology one and two and nursing program. I mean, you're going to know all this front and back, upside down, inside out, and six ways to Sunday. But as a CNA, it's really not required. But what you do need to know is that anything that affects one body system will invariably affect others. It's just because the whole body is all one, right? Let me give you kind of an example of that. Spring Hill, not a real big city. It's not Tampa, not a really small town. It's not Dinellan. <laughs> it's kind of eh, middle of the road, right? If something happened way on the other side, like by the airport, it probably wouldn't affect us too much. You wouldn't think, right? But it actually has the effect or it has the potential to affect us. So let's say that something small happens way over there, a little car accident between a gas truck and a vehicle. And now all the gas stations on that side of town aren't going to get gas. Well, it doesn't affect us over here. We got plenty of gas, plenty of gas stations. It might affect people on that side of town. They might grumble a little bit, but they'll get it cleaned up and they'll get it fixed, right? Small problems tend to stay local. Big problems tend to have a bigger effect. So let's say that there's not a car accident on over by the airport. Let's say that the entire area gets wiped out by a meteor strike. So everything from the parkway over, gone. Now, all the roads are obliterated. They don't work anymore. 
So a lot of the stuff that we get comes over from that side of town. So we may not be able to get milk. We may not be able to get gas very easily. You know, a lot of our deliveries are going to be interrupted. Traffic would be interrupted. People may not be able to get home from work, right? So that has a much wider effect. Even though that meteor strike didn't affect us, it didn't land here, we're still alive. We're going to feel the effects of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's what happens in the body. When something affects one of these systems, it's going to have a ripple effect into others. So if you have a patient who has congestive heart failure, well, the name tells you it's a problem with the heart, right? Congestive heart failure. What it doesn't tell you is all the other organs that that will affect. So you need to be aware that if a patient has a, a condition, we're going to have things on the care plan that may not make sense to you. They may not automatically connect those dots, but the nurse knows those dots are connected because they understand how all of this works together and they're trying to prevent those potential problems. So that's why we always follow the care plan. Good. Okay. Did anybody catch the uh, game show yesterday on YouTube? I did the first uh, live game show and it was test questions. So questions that you would find on the written state exam and it's interactive. So when I'm live on the game show, everybody on YouTube, like right now I've got everybody, you know, all these people on YouTube, the question would come up and they would type their answer in the chat. You know, like, you know, if I gave you a question and said A, B, C, or D, you guys would shout out the answer, right? Well, they're just typing it in the chat. Well, the program that I use actually reads that chat. And it awards points for answers. And then there's a leaderboard and the first two people get prizes. Like I give away um, badge holders and card games. And uh, it's free to join, but it's a great practice for the written test because the test questions are very similar to what you would find on the state exam. When are you doing the Every other Tuesday okay. at 11 a.m. So two weeks from yesterday will be the next one. Oh, 11 a.m. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, I do it at 11 a.m. So I go live at different times for different time zones, right? So Thursday, tomorrow, I go live at 3 p.m for a question and answer session. I always give a lesson and then I take questions. Um, today and Monday, I am live from nine to one. And then every other Tuesday, I'm live at 11 because the schools um, are in session and they can use that for practice for their students. So yeah, I go live a lot. <laughs> All right, so any questions on this? Understanding the... Um, the way the body systems all work together. Any questions on that? So um, your homework over the weekend is gonna be chapters five and six. Five, you wanna pay attention to. Five is on dementia. You're gonna have a lot of dementia patients in your career. So you need to understand a little bit about dementia. So pay attention to chapter five. Chapter six is on skills, and we cover that in class. So you don't need to read all the step-by-step -step instructions on the skills. Read the paragraphs in between. You will notice that there is a difference between how the textbook tells you to do skills and how I tell you to do skills. If there is a conflict, who do you listen to? Me. That textbook is generic. It's for all states. I am specific to what you're, you need to learn for this test, okay? So if there is a conflict, you always refer back to me. Good. All right, so let's move on. Does anybody have any questions about the skills that we've learned so far? Any questions about the skills we've covered so far? All right, by the time we're done today, we will be half done with all of our skills. 
We have um, one more principle to learn. We've learned everything else on the back wall. We have one more principle to learn and that's shoe rules. We'll be learning that on Monday. I will touch on it just briefly today, but we will be learning it in detail on Monday. And then all we're gonna do from here on out is use these principles to build skills. So these are your building blocks. So every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with a, how do you know what to do with each patient? Care plan. Um, if you're gonna use supplies, what do you put on the table first? Barrier. Barrier. Um, you have to evaluate every skill for gloves, right? Doesn't matter what the skill is, you're gonna find out, do I need gloves for this patient? Um, if you're going to uh, have the patient uncovered or undressed, you need a privacy blanket. Um, do you hold stuff up against your uniform? No. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. Patients must always be in the middle of the bed. If we're going to turn them, where, where are we, in front of them or behind them? Behind them. Um, if we're going to wash, whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Who checks the water? Yeah, us and the patient. Very good. All basins are cleaned the same way. Rinse it, dry it, store it. Um, and all skills in the same way. Right? Comfort, curtain, call light, clean environment. Clean your hands. Chart if necessary. Clean again. Right. So you know all this. You've learned all of that already. All we're going to do is take those same principles and make skills out of them. So it doesn't matter what we learn now. You're going to see some familiarity, even though you may not know the skill at all. There's going to be familiar elements to it. So it's not like you're learning complete skills from beginning to end that are all different. Right. The first four are always the same. Doesn't matter what your skill is. You still follow the care plan. You still do your opening. You still use a barrier and you still evaluate for gloves. Doesn't matter, you know, what anything else is going on. Every, end skill, or every skill ends the same way with closing. Doesn't matter what else you're doing. You know that that's got to be done. So half of your skill for every single checkpoint, every single checklist that we use, half of your skill you already know. You already know. So what we need to do now is fill in those little gaps that you don't know that are specific to the skill. Okay, good. All right, so right now we're going to go to page 98. And we're going to learn about supported sideline position. Now, one of the things that I do want to encourage you guys to do is practice, and we will have a little bit of practice time built into class today. We will have more on Monday. By next Wednesday, you'll have about an hour and a half of practice time in class. Um, so as we go through the program, the further we get into it, the more practice, the less I talk, the more practice you have. But you still have this room available to you to practice on Mondays and Wednesdays up until 4 p.m. So if you wanna stay in practice, make a friend and you can stay in practice until four. You can also come in and practice after graduation for a month from 1.30 until four. So if you look at your ID badge on the very back, it says practice room. You guys see it? 1.30 to 4. So you have the ability to come, excuse me, come in here and practice anytime that you wish during those hours. But you do need to practice because the problem is that I'm going to make this look easy. I've been doing it a very long time. I can't make it look hard anymore. I just can't. I can do this stuff in my sleep. It's easy for me. Not so easy for you, though, because you're, you're new right? It's, it's okay to be slow when you're new. It's okay. You are not going to have the same level of ability I do. The problem is that you're going to look or you're going to sit over there and look at me and think, oh, that's easy. I got that. No, you don't. You really don't. You need to do the skills. So practice is going to become a very important component of what you're going to do from here on out. Do not go to the test unless you have practiced every single skill at least once. 
because the one you didn't practice is absolutely the one you'll get. I guarantee it. I don't know how the cosmos knows, but they know. <laughs> and they, they, I've heard it a million times. Make sure you practice them all. All right, so our care plan for this skill, this is supported sideline position. Care plan at the top of the page says, position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. So that's what we have to do. If you look at the bottom of the page, you're gonna see this is going to be done on a live testing student. That means one of you might be the patient for this. It tells you that somebody with your level of ability should be able to complete this within eight minutes. You're turning somebody on their side. You're using a couple of pillows to keep them there. It doesn't take eight minutes to get that done. But I am gonna show you a really cool technique to turn somebody on their side. You can turn somebody three times your body weight with no stress on you or them. So I'm gonna show you a really cool technique to learn that will help you turn patients without hurting yourself or them, okay? Um, and it's all about the prep work. All right. So we're gonna talk about scoot and roll. We talked a little bit about this earlier in the program. We know that the patient must remain in the middle of the bed at all times. And we know that we always turn the patient away from us, right? We remain behind the patients behind. You guys remember me talking about that? Okay. So we also learned that um, if a patient is in bed normally, they will always position themselves in the middle of the bed. We don't really have to tell them to do that. They'll do that on their own. We saw that with the demonstration that I did in class, right? right? Where this becomes difficult is if we're going to ask a patient to turn over on their side or if we're going to do the turning, we have to remember there's an extra step. We scoot them toward us first so that after the turn, they're in the middle. You don't just walk up to somebody laying in the middle of the bed and roll them. You have to scoot them towards you first and then roll them. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you scoot them? Well, the care plan should give you some direction if the patient has a particular problem, okay? Patient has osteoporosis, it may tell you to use a, a um, draw sheet. If the patient has um, uh, abdominal surgery, it may tell you to use the segment method. So you just move them in pieces, like you know their legs, their hips, their shoulders, their head. Um, there's also slide sheets. Slide sheets are pretty cool. They're like ultra slippery. It's kind of like a slip and slide, but you don't need water to make it slippery. They're super slippery. You put it under the patient and it almost levitates them. You can just kind of slide them towards you, easy peasy. But slide sheets are pretty expensive and they're usually locked up in a supervisor's office somewhere and you got to sign them out and sign them back in so they don't walk off. So they're not always um, convenient to get to. We use draw sheets a whole lot more. So draw sheet is just a regular sheet, top sheet, folded in half, long ways, and put underneath the patient tuck under the mattress so the member nothing touches the floor right under the mattress and then you can undo it you know un untuck it and use that uh draw sheet to pull the patient towards you so draw sheets are actually talked about on page 99 you can see there how they work um draw sheets are used a lot in clinical settings one of the things you need to know about draw sheets is the folded edge always goes under the shoulders not, you know, the, the area where the two, like this, you know, if, if the sheet ended there, I wouldn't want these two ends, free ends under the shoulder. I want the folded edge under the shoulder. That's the one thing you need to know about draw sheets. For the test, we're not using draw sheets. We're not even using segments. We're just going to ask the patient, can you scoot toward me? Nice, easy. Once you get them scooted towards you though, then we have to position them properly for the turn. So scoot and roll is going to play a part in this skill. Let's talk about why. Oh, 
Oh, thank you. Okay, thanks, Erica. I'll, I'll write that down. Okay. All right, so let's talk about side reels real quick because this is one of those things that is, um, it, it's kind of, there's a concept called false cognition. It means that you know something to be true, but it's actually not true, right? You, you think you know something, but you actually know it wrong. And that's what side rails are. It used to be a million years ago when I was in nursing school, every bed had side rails and you were told to put the side rails up before you left every patient. Side rails always had to be up, right? That's actually a problem. And it contributed to a lot of patient injuries and deaths. And let me explain to you why. So up here, you see a crib, right? Who do we use cribs for? Why do you use a crib for a baby? Okay, so it's safety, right? Right, we put them in a crib to keep them safe. But that only works for a short amount of time. Once the child hits about a year and a half old, what do they start doing? Climbing out. And now, is that crib really keeping them safe? No, it's actually increasing their risk of injury because instead of falling off of a bed, right? Short distance to the floor. Now they have to climb up and over and now they're falling from this distance, not this one. That increases the risk of injury, doesn't it? So are you guys all still slipping in cribs? What happens when you start climbing out of a crib? Okay, yeah, M mom says, oh, that's no, no good. <laughs> We're risking injury, right? My kid could hurt themselves climbing out of the crib. We need to get them into something safer. So they usually get toddler beds, you know, the ones that are really close to the floor. And, you know, we usually put something soft on the floor <laughs> so that because you're learning how to sleep in a bed, when you fall out of bed, you're not getting hurt. You don't get injured, right? Okay. So what this teaches us is when somebody is mobile, able to move, if you, pre if you present an obstacle to them, that obstacle is not going to stop them from getting out. It's only going to increase the risk of injury. Adults are mobile. Now we've got another situation on top of this, and this one is actually a little bit more psychological. There are people, a lot of them, that when you tell them to do something, they will do whatever they want to do. They are not going to listen to you. Anybody know somebody like that? Yeah, me, me. You tell me to sit in this chair. If I don't feel like sitting in this chair, do you think I'm going to listen to you? No, I am an adult. If I want to get up, I'm going to get up. Now, there may be consequences, sure. I'm prepared to deal with those consequences because I am an adult and I am free to make that decision myself, right? So unfortunately, we tend to forget this. We, we know those rules apply to us, but we don't think it applies to anybody else. Right? So when we put an adult patient in a bed and we tell them to stay in that bed, chances are they're not gonna, especially if they have to pee. And when they hit that call light and they wait and they wait and they wait and nobody comes, you think they're really gonna stay in that bed and pee themselves? What are they gonna do? They're gonna get up and try to make it to the bathroom, right? Is that their fault that we didn't answer the call light? No. no. So what we do as caregivers is we go in and we start yelling at them. I told you to stay in the bed. That does no good to anybody. First of all, you have no authority to tell any adult anything and expect it to stick. 
Who are you? I mean, you're nobody. You are another adult. They don't have to listen to you. I don't care what your badge says. Your badge can say CNA, RN, MD. Doesn't matter. That's an adult. They have the right to get up. So then what we decide to do, okay, well, if you're going to get up out of bed, I'm going to make it harder for you. And I'm going to put the side rails up, to keep you where I think you should be. Now, that patient is still getting out of bed, but what did we do? Yeah, we increased the risk. We made it more likely that they're going to get injured. Absolutely. Side rails do not keep people safe, ever, ever. Side rails increase the risk for injury. The only time side rails should be used is if this bed is in motion, kind of like a theme park ride, right? If the vehicle's in motion, we got to do something to keep you in the vehicle. So side rails up when the vehicle is in motion, that is indicated. Other than that, nope, no side rails. If for some reason you think side rails should be used, you do not have the authority to make that decision. Ever, ever. The only person that can make that decision is the doctor. Nurses can't even make that decision. So if I'm a nurse and I think this patient needs side rails to keep them safe, I have to call the doctor and get the order. And then the doctor has to physically come in and look at that patient with their own eyeballs within four hours of giving me that order. They can't take my word for it. Because freedom of movement is a legally protected standard. You do not have the right to restrict anybody's freedom of movement, even if it is for their own good. I hate that saying. I hate that saying. Does that also apply to like the hospital beds where you have like the ones at the top? We're going to talk about that. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in just one second. Right, right. Those aren't side rails. Those are positioning rails. But I'm going to go over that in just one second. All right. So do you guys see side rails a little bit different? Okay. One of the biggest reasons that side rails are used is because the patient is a fall risk. Okay. A lot of caregivers will look at this patient and think, okay, I don't want her out of bed. She's weak. She's dizzy. She's on medication, whatever the case may be. Um, she's old, whatever. She's a fall risk. So in order to keep her from falling, I'm going to put the side rails up so that she doesn't get out of bed, right? Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Sounds perfectly reasonable until you realize that healthcare is supposed to improve health. If we stick somebody in bed and they don't get up, What's going to happen to their muscles? They're going to get weaker. What's going to happen to their bone density? That's right. So did we improve her health by keeping her in bed? No, we might have prevented a fall. But we could also prevent falls by getting the patient up with a staff member and walking them regularly to improve their muscle strength, their coordination, their bone density. That is how we properly handle it. Not sticking them in bed, putting the side rails up and letting them rot. All in the name of safety. So we have to rethink the way we see patients. We have to reevaluate why we're using side rails. The majority of time, side rails are actually used for our convenience, but we use them in the name of patient safety. We have to be careful not to fall into that trap. Does that make sense? Okay. This is important because as you go through your career, you're going to think to yourself a whole lot of times, man, that patient needs to stay in bed. And that's a trap. Be careful there. So let me talk to you about one, the legal side of side rails. This is something that isn't talked about a whole lot. If I were to go up to any of you right now and I were to physically put my hands on you to restrain you, to keep you in that chair, 
And you did not want my hands on you. You did not want to be restrained. Would you guys have an issue with that? Yes. Yeah. Remember that the legal principle is nobody has the right to touch you unless you give them that right. You're an adult. The children are a different story, but you're an adult. No one has the right to put their hands on you or restrict your movement unless you give them that right. Now, if I grab one of you and threw you in my trunk and closed the door, or closed the lid, what would you call that? Kidnapping, right? False imprisonment, right? Well, in healthcare, we do this all the time. We put people in confined spaces and we call it healthcare. No, it's false imprisonment. You don't have the right to do that. There's only three people in the entire planet, three types of people that have the right to interfere with your freedom of movement. And two of them are temporary, two of them, right? Can I just decide to put you in jail? No, what has to happen? Well, first you have to be arrested and processed, and then you have to go to court, and then the judge has to decide what to do with you, right? But it's not just the judge. You've got to ha actually have a jury of your peers. So 12 reasonable people have to agree that this is a reasonable, there's a whole lot of things that have to go on, right? Before I can put you in jail. It's not like automatic. I can't decide, you know, you cut me off in traffic, you're going to jail. It, it doesn't work that way. I'm an adult, you're an adult. There's a process that has to be followed, right? In medicine, we seem to forget about all this, right? There's only three people that, three types of people that can interfere with your freedom of movement. One of those is law enforcement. They can arrest you, but that's temporary. The other one is doctors. They can restrain you, but it's, Temporary. In order to make it any longer, it has to go before a judge. You guys see that? Doesn't matter whether you're a criminal or a patient. And personally, I don't think we should be treating patients like criminals. That kind of gives the whole, the wrong impression all the way around. So be careful about how you think about restraints. Does this make sense? Now, if the patient is a danger to themselves or others, then we can institute this process. So we have to be careful about it. And remember, it's temporary. A judge has to make the final decision for anything long term. Good? Questions? Okay. Are you starting to look at side rails a little different? All right, so there's, <laughs> there's two different types of side rails. So we wanna talk about this because this can get confusing. All right, so a lot of places have what we call half rails or positioning rails. These are short rails at the top of the bed. This can be used by patients. They can grab onto them and roll over, or scoot themselves up, or you know, it's they're, they're, help, they're to help the patient's position. They do not interfere with the patient's ability to get out of bed because it stops at the hip area. That means a patient can swing their legs out and there's nothing obstructing them. This is a positioning rail. It is not a side rail. Now, if I put this one up, now I've reduced the patient's ability of getting out of bed safely. And now the patient has to go over or under or around or through these rails, and that increases the risk of injury and death. You know, it's amazing how many people these things kill. And it's scary because when patients die from side rails, they usually die from strangulation because they manage to get themselves in a situation where the side rails end up blocking their blood supply. I have seen people lose legs because of side rails, because their leg gets caught 
inside the side rail. It reduces blood circulation. Nobody notices it. Nobody checks. And the leg, the, the muscles in the leg die and it has to be amputated. So we have specific rules when side rails are being used, when any restraints are being used, any restraints at all. We have to check on those patients every 15 minutes. And I mean, head to toe checks. You've got to make sure that nothing is pinched or caught or um, injured. You have to look to make sure that the patient isn't, uh, is safe, they can breathe. Um, this, is, this is important. I mean, really important. So you got to check on them every 15 minutes and then you got to let them out every two hours so they can move, so we can restore circulation, right? We can't just lock them up and let them rot. And unfortunately, it's what happens a lot. So any questions on side rails? Would you depending on the circumstances, would you be able to do like the two position rows and then one at the bottom because maybe- Not without a, uh, a doctor's order. Not a single one, okay. Nope, not without a doctor's order. And because CNAs can never make that decision and either can nurses, let me explain why. Horrible. A um, couple of years ago, a nursing home, the staff, the evening staff, uh, was caught <clears throat> dosing all the patients with Benadryl, putting them all in beds with the side rails up so that the this, this staff didn't have to work. Yeah, they were caught in the um, uh, staff lounge area playing cards. All of their patients were drugged and restrained. Now, if that were my family member, do you think I'd be okay with it? No, I could tell you what I would do, <laughs> but it'd probably get me in trouble, right? These are somebody's family members, guys. And the problem is that we can't trust anybody to do the right thing all the time. So we have to have rules in place. We have to have laws that punish if you do the wrong thing. One of those rules is the only person that can make that determination is the doctor because we can't trust that you're going to have the well being of the patient in mind. But we have a lot of other options. We don't need side rails, actually, in most cases. We have something called restraint alternatives. Your book will go into detail on this, but restraint alternatives don't block the patient's ability to get out of bed but we might be able to use a bed alarm that sounds when the patient gets up. So now we know the patient's on the move. And remember, it's always safer for patients to be moving, but with monitors, with assistance, right? So if you hear an, a bed alarm, you get up and you go to help the patient, right? Didn't restrict their ability to move, but it did make it a little bit safer for them. Now, patients that roll out of bed that have no, we're gonna talk about, um, uh, spatial awareness in a minute, but people that have no spatial awareness that roll out of bed, well, we don't want to use side rails for that because remember, they'll, if they get up, they now have an obstacle. So what we would do is take this bed, we actually have something called low boy beds, take the bed all the way to the floor. So it's about this far off the floor, just high enough for a mattress. And then we put a pad on the floor. That way, if they roll, they're rolling onto the pad, which is a softer surface. Right, So now we solve the problem without using side rails. So what we have to do is get a little bit more creative in, ha in how we solve the underlying issue rather than defaulting to side rails. I've seen um, some beds that they have a zipper part on the side mm -hmm. and a piece of foam goes up into it right. too. Is that... Because I mean, I'm I'm from Kentucky and I worked in Kentucky and Ohio. So, but I know different things are like there's different. Laws. Yeah, those are called yeah, those are called bolsters, yeah. and uh, they can be used for positioning. They are not supposed to be used 
for restrict, remember restrict anything that restricts a patient's, and that's the, that's the legal definition. Anything that restricts a patient's freedom of movement can be considered a restraint. So now we have to look at intent. I think they used it because the patient, um, she was brought against it and it was there to create a soft barrier. Right. But I didn't know if- So again, we're, yeah, we're, we're going to look at intent. Okay. And that's really what it all boils down to. There's a lot of legal principles here and I don't want to get too deep into that. The thing that a CNA needs to understand is they never make that decision ever. Not your call. That's what you need to know about restraints. Not your call. If a restraint is ordered, you have to check on them every 15 minutes and let them out every two hours. That's what you need to know about restraints. But there's a lot of gray area here. We can use bolsters for a lot of different reasons, for positioning, for padding, for but they can be used for restraints too. So we're looking at intent. It also depends on how easy that item is to remove, right? If it's just a pillow that the patient can move on their own, that would never be considered a restraint because the patient has the ability to move it, right? So there's a lot of things that have to be looked at here, a lot of um, things to evaluate. Not it, unfortunately, it's not really cut and dry. Um, but yeah, in that situation, it probably was used more for padding, bolstering. All right, so I want to explain to you a little bit about, I figure out where we were a little bit about why we're turning this patient. So everything I just talked to you about with side rails is on page 94 and 95, and you can read that on your own. Now we're gonna to go to page 96 and talk about immobile patients. And that's really what today is all about, or this skill. So if we have a patient that can't roll on their own, our care plan is going to tell us to turn them and reposition them on a, a specific schedule. Usually it's every two hours around the clock, around the clock. That means at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m., we're actually getting the patient up and, and turning them. They're not gonna sleep through the night it, every two hours around the clock. Um, if the patient can move on their own, well, we don't have to be involved. It's when they're unable to move on their own that this becomes a problem. Now, you guys demonstrate this all the time. When you come in and sit down in these chairs, you don't sit perfectly still. What do you do? Yeah, you fidget. You cross your legs. You uncross your legs. You lean on the table. You sit up straight. You're always moving, right? Anybody know why? Okay, you get tired of sitting still. The reason you get tired of sitting still actually has everything to do with your circulatory system. Your circulation. That's because on planet Earth, we have gravity. I am not a fan of gravity. <laughs> As you can see, it pulls me down. So on planet Earth, we have gravity. Gravity is always pulling everything down to the center of the Earth. Now, whatever area of your body is closest to the floor is what's going to feel the effects of gravity. So right now, my entire body weight is being pulled down through my feet. So over time, that's going to make my feet hurt and I'm going to end up, you know, changing position, probably doing this, maybe putting my foot up on something, you know, I'll shift to another side, right? I'm going to be moving because the bottom of my feet are feeling all of that weight pulling down. Good. When you're sitting on your bottom, all of your body weight is being pulled through down through your bottom. So you tend to shift and that's why you cross your legs, you uncross your legs, you kind of, you know, shift your body weight, you move around because you're, you're trying to relieve that pressure. And that's because if you remember, uh, we learned about this, hold on, let me get you the page. Go back, keep your hand on page 97, go back to page 81 real quick. Look at the top of page 81, that graphic. You remember the layers of skin we talked about? You've got skin, you've got fat, you've got muscle, you've got vessels, right? Okay, so 
if I am sitting on my bottom, that is inverted, right? So I've got skin, fat, muscle, vessels. If all of my body weight is pressing down, I'm squishing off those blood vessels. Squish. If I'm squishing off those blood vessels, blood's not going to be able to move through them. Now, what do you think happens to fat and muscle and other tissue if it doesn't get blood? Okay. Hmm? It dies. It dies. Every cell in your body needs blood to survive. Every one. So if we're squishing those blood vessels and we're not getting good blood to the area, that area could effectively die. Is that a good thing? No. So that's why you fidget. That's why you move. That's why you change position. And you even do this when you're sleeping. When you go to bed at night and you lay down, you do not wake up in the exact same position that you went to sleep in. You toss and turn all night long. Toss and turn. That's because the longer you lay on one area, the more pressure is applied to that area, the less blood flow it gets. That rings a bell in your brain that says we are uncomfortable and you change position. Good, make sense? Okay, so what we need to understand, go back to page 97, what we need to understand, or 96, uh, is that we do this on our own without our brain really telling us that we're doing it. We fidget, we move, we change position. But what if you were unable to change position? What if you couldn't move on your own? Would that be a problem? So when we have somebody who is unable to move on their own, either they're too weak or they've had surgery or they have a serious injury or maybe they've had a stroke and they're paralyzed, there's a lot of different reasons, but if the patient is unable to move on their own, the nurse knows that this is a potential problem. So we would put on the care plan that you need to turn and reposition the patient every two hours around the clock. Now I'm gonna show you just how quickly these changes can occur, okay? I just said every two hours around the clock, but it actually takes way less time than that to show effects on your skin. So what I want you to do is take one of your hands and put it underneath your leg or your bottom. And you're gonna leave it there for two minutes. I'm gonna tell you when the two minutes is up, all right? So you're gonna to wanna to pull it out before then. Trust me, you will. I'm gonna ask you to keep it in place for just two minutes while I talk. So normally, if we're gonna change a patient's position every two hours around the clock, we go from the back to the right side. Two hours later, back to their back. Two hours later, left side. Two hours later, back to their back. Right, back, left, back. Right, back, left, back. Every two hours around the clock, don't skip. Now what some CNAs do is that they think to themselves, oh, I don't wanna wake Mrs. McGillicuddy up at 2 a.m. She hasn't been sleeping well, that's horrible. I'm just going to let her sleep. Don't do that because those blood vessels are being squished, 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 squished. And the longer they're squished, the more likely the tissue is to die. And this doesn't take as long to happen as you think it does. Bed sores, which is pressure that's applied to an area that results in the death of tissue. And when the tissue dies, it opens. Bed sores can occur in as little as 20 minutes in the right circumstances. So if you leave a patient in one position all night long, they can end up with a huge bed sore. So you've got about 20 seconds more. Don't take your hand out yet. But when you do, when I ask you to take your hand out, I want you to take it out from underneath you and I want you to look at it. I want you to look for color changes, but more importantly, I want you to look for lines. Are there lines from where your clothing um, pressed against it? Or can you see the fabric of the chair 
imprinted in your skin. So go ahead and pull your hand out and take a quick look. You guys see any changes to the skin? All right. How long was that, guys? Two minutes. You've already got imprinting on your skin in two minutes. Those lines are just going to get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually they will cut through the skin. The longer you leave it there, the more likely it is to happen. This is why we have to change a patient's position every two hours around the clock. You guys are all healthy. And yet you imprinted in two minutes. Somebody that's not healthy, that has poor circulation, has diabetes, has um, a poor protein intake, those people are going to feel results way quicker than that. Good? You guys see why this might be a problem? So how often do you have to change patient's position? Every two hours around the clock. Do not let them sleep through the night. You are not doing them any favors at all. All right. All right, so we're gonna change patient's position every two hours around the clock or as often as directed on the care plan. I was a hospice nurse for a long time. And I said that you guys are all healthy. You don't have any you know, significant medical conditions that would speed this up. But if somebody has a poor protein intake, this can affect bed sore formation. If somebody has um, osteoporosis, this can affect it. If somebody has diabetes or poor circulation, this can affect it. Well, in hospice, that pretty much is everybody. Somebody, yeah, everybody's gonna fit one of those categories. So in hospice, my care plan, when I have an immobile patient, somebody in the last stages of their life that isn't able to move on their own, my care plans may say to change the patient's position every hour around the clock to prevent bed sores. Bed sores are the one thing that we have total control over. Total control. Bed sore formation automatically means that this patient was not cared for properly. Because if they have increased risk factors, it means we should be turning them more often. Good. This infuriates me, bed sores. And the number one place they happen is in hospitals. Long-term care, pretty good. They know this happens. So they're pretty good about turning the patients every two hours around the clock. In a hospital setting, for some reason, they just kind of skip right over this. And the patients lay there for days and days and days, and they end up with bed sores. And these things can take years to heal. Have you ever had a paper cut? How much does a paper cut hurt? All right, now imagine that paper cut that goes all the way to your bone. That's gonna take forever to heal, and it's gonna be immensely painful. I have seen bed sores on patients' lower backs or coccyx areas that I could stick my entire fist in. That did not happen overnight. That is profound neglect. And somebody should be held accountable for that. My grandma had a bunch of bed sores when she was growing. She had like dementia, like Alzheimer's, but her sores like on her back were huge. And she got it on her like her heels. Mm -hmm. so she was pulling the bed sore. She died. Yeah. And she had like, you know, like when old people, they get like UTIs and stuff. Mm -hmm. She just started declining and also the bed sore. So she couldn't heal properly. Yeah, no, you, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to heal a bed sore. Very difficult. And the thing is, they can be prevented. I mean, that there's, you know, this is, this is important stuff. So every two hours around the clock by default or more often if on the care plan. So again, we're going to go from their back to the right side, to the back, to the left. Notice stomach isn't on there. You guys see that? We don't put immobile patients on their stomach unless the care plan specifically tells you to. Because if the patient has a, a nerve problem, 
or a strength problem, you have to open your lungs for air to come in. If you're laying on your tummy, your lungs may not be able to open enough for the air to get in. And we can actually suffocate somebody by putting them on their stomach. This is why we tell you not to put babies on their stomach because their nerves may not have matured enough to expand that chest cavity when they're on their stomach. Pretty cool, right? Um, now there are some conditions that we do have patients on their stomach, but that would be reflected in the care plan. Always refer to the care plan. They're doing all the thinking for you. All you have to do is follow the recipe, right? So if we are gonna turn a patient, we're gonna set them up to turn easily. So remember, I'm always turning a patient away from me. I'm gonna remain behind the patients behind. And I'm gonna scoot them toward me on the bed first so that after the roll, they're in the middle of the bed, right? We've talked about all of that. Now, when you're setting this up to turn the patient, the way you set it up is super important. The furthest arm, so I'm gonna stand on this side of the bed, okay? If I'm the patient and I'm going to be turning over this way, I'm gonna be on this side of the bed because I'm gonna turn the patient away from me. The furthest arm goes up over the head. The closest arm crosses the chest. So your patient's gonna look like this. If I were turning the patient this way, furthest arm up, closest arm over, okay? Furthest arm up, closest arm over, good? The closest knee is gonna be bent with the foot flat on the bed. So the, the knee is gonna be tented. The furthest knee is angled out. So your patient looks like this. Arm up, arm over, knee up, knee angled. When you do this, it is super easy. No effort required. Hand on the shoulder, one on the hip, and they just roll. Because you've already got most of their weight distributed in that direction. So there's no stress on you or them. And this is how you can turn somebody three times your body weight without a lot of effort. But this isn't what most people do. So unfortunately, um, when CNAs go to turn patients, they just come up to a patient that's laying down and they, they try to like manhandle them and push them over. And that's going to hurt the patient because you're using a lot of force and it's really easy to bruise patients. So that, that doesn't work. You need to get them in the right position first before you roll them. And then they roll just beautifully, super easy. But they're not gonna stay in that position. They're, they're not gonna stay on their side by themselves. They won't. Gravity always wins. Gravity is gonna pull people back. When you're laying on your side, most of your weight distribution is along the back side of you. So gravity will always try to pull the patient back onto their back. So if I get somebody laying on their side using this technique, I did a good job, but they're not going to stay there. I've got to use some things to help keep them there. And I'm going to use some pillows. The first pillow is going to go behind their back in a roll that keeps them in that side position. The second pillow is going to go between their legs because I don't want those bones of the knees rubbing together. That can cause bed sores, right? I don't want the bones of the ankles rubbing together because that could cause bed sores. So I want that pillow between those areas, between the knees and the ankles so those bones don't touch. I need a pillow under the top arm because when the patient's laying on their side, that top arm kind of droops down. That puts a lot of pressure along the upper back and into the head, it can cause muscle spasms, headaches, all kinds of bad stuff. So I'm gonna put a pillow under that top arm to get it in a neutral position. And then I'm gonna adjust the pillow under the head just to make sure it's not under that shoulder scrunching it up, okay? So we're gonna add three pillows and adjust the one that's already on the bed. Good. The rest of this skill you already know. We follow the, every skill starts with a, okay. We're gonna use a barrier because we have supplies. We evaluate if we need gloves. This patient's gonna be uncovered. So I need a, I'm not gonna hold anything up against my 
uniform and I'm going to end the skill the same way I end everything. You already know all that. So this part is what you need to learn. Right? Easy. Easy peasy. Questions? No? I need somebody to go lay in that bed under the top sheet for me, please. And I will show you this skill. Can I get you to take your sweater off for me, if you would? It's just going to be too hard for me to work around. And under the sheet. Thank you. Just lay down, get comfortable. I'm going to make you the most comfortable you've ever been. Oh, that doesn't look right. <laughs> Scoot down a little bit. There you go. Better? Okay. All right. Okay, guys, here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Fantastic. I need to turn you on to your left side. Is that okay? All right. I'm going to go close your curtain, wash my hands, and I'll be right back. How do I know which side to put her on? Care the care plan. Pay attention to the care plan during the test because it's going to tell you either right side or left side. Make sure that you're paying attention to that. Okay. So let me go wash my hands. So I'm going to come over here to the sink. I'm going to turn the water on, wet my hand, and get the soap. How much soap do I need? A lot. I'm gonna look at the clock when I start rubbing together. I'm gonna to rub the tops of my wrists, the backs of my hands in between my fingers, in between my thumb and index finger, both sides, the bottom of my hand by my pinky, and the palm of my hand. And that is 20 seconds. So I'm gonna move on to my nails, cleaning each nail. Circle the nails on the palm of my hand, and then I'm going to rinse. When I rinse, I don't want to touch the sink or the faucet. And I'm going to tap. I'm going to use some paper towels just to dry what's clean. Throw those away and turn the faucet off with a clean, dry paper towel. All right, now that I have clean hands, I'm going to get a barrier and put it on my table. And I'm going to get three pillows. And remember, I don't want to hold them against my uniform. So one, two, three pillows. And I need a privacy blanket. Move these over here so the camera can see them. All right, Miss Jones, I'm going to put this blanket over you. This will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this skill, okay? So I'm going to unfold. Can you hold this for me? Thank you. And I'm going to pull the sheet down. Okay, can you scoot your whole body toward me so you're laying on your back? closer to the edge here. Little tiny bit more, there you go. Perfect, perfect. All right, so now I'm going to um, get ready to turn you, okay? So you can relax your arms. This arm, the furthest arm is gonna go up above her head. The closest arm is gonna cross the chest. The closest knee is gonna be bent with a foot flat on the bed. And then the furthest knee is going to be angled out. There you go. Just relax for me. Notice she's half on her side already. So it doesn't take any effort at all. Hand on the shoulder, one on the hip. She did not help. Me. That's how easy it is to turn someone. But she's not going to stay in this position by herself. So I'm going to get a pillow. And this pillow is the hard one, guys. 
So I'm going to lay this up against her back, kind of like a C slope. And I'm going to put this edge of the pillow underneath the patient right here. So I have to push down and then forward. I can't just push forward because her body's there. Down, forward. So we're going to go down, hold her uniform top up, and forward. So it tucks underneath the patient. See how that's under the patient? Now I'm going to do the same thing with this edge. I'm going to push it down and forward. So it forms a roll under her back. See the roll? You feel that support? Okay. Now I'm going to come to this side of the bed. We're going to take this pillow. And I'm going to place it between her legs, specifically between the, the knees and the ankle. So I'm going to lift her leg up. And I want this top leg slightly ahead of the bottom one. That puts her in better alignment. And then this pillow, the last one, is going to go underneath her top arm. And that just holds that arm in a more neutral position. Notice it's not over her face. You don't want to put the pillow like this. <laughs> you want it under the arm. Now, this uh, pillow that's already on the bed, she doesn't look comfortable. If you look at how her head is positioned, it's not very comfortable. So I'm going to lift her head up and adjust that pillow a little bit. And I'm going to take this arm and put it underneath the pillow. How's that? Yeah, ready for a nap, right? So now I'm going to pull the sheet back up. Make sure it's neat. This is going to be thrown away because I'm cleaning my environment. That's away. Make sure this is nice and neat. All right. Now, the call light needs to be placed in the patient's hand. I can't just lay it over here. Remember, she's not able to move. So I don't want to put it over her neck either. That would be a strangling hazard. So I'm going to make sure that I'm on the side of the bed that she has turned toward. And I'm going to bring the call light around in front of her and place it right in her hand. If you need anything at all, just press that red button, okay? Are you comfortable? <laughs> Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Would you like a magazine, which makes absolutely no sense, I know, but we're gonna offer it anyway. Okay, all right, if you need anything at all, just press that red button, I'll be in to help you. And I'm going to open the curtain, look around, my environment's clean, wash my hands, think about my steps, make any corrections. I'll probably look at that care plan one more time and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Don't move yet. I wanna show you something. I'm gonna take the sheet off. So my skill is done. And now I'm just demonstrating something for you. Oops, correction, I would've taken the blanket off. I skipped a step. So we're gonna take this off of the bed and put it in dirty linen. I don't know how I missed that. All right, I want you to pay attention to this pillow. What, I just want you to relax for me. Watch what her body does when I take this pillow away. See how much she came back? Do you see how she's now positioned more in this direction? That means she's gonna roll onto her back at some point and I've lost the, the benefit of having her on her side. This is the important pillow. This is the one that's hard to get placed, but it's also the one that's doing the most good. Isn't it a whole lot more comfortable with that pillow behind your back? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna take them all away. <laughs> all right. Thank you. She feels good right there. Thank you. You can just leave that. All right. Any questions on that skill? Any questions? Would there be um, 
any difference in patient preferences or anything like that? Like if you were rolling them and they were like, oh, well, I should like my leg position this way. Sure, that- absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm showing you one. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and I always try to listen to patient preferences. They know their body better than I do. But if it's something that's like really outside of the norm, you need to check with the nurse. Because patients may not understand the benefit of certain things that we're doing. Okay. Good. Any other questions on that? All right, let's go ahead and take our break. When we get back, we're going to get into foot care. Awesome, Aisha. Aisha says, I passed with Miss Patty's help. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations to you. Bueno, por ejemplo, hacer una cama no es tan difícil. ¿eh? Hacer una cama no es tan difícil. No, no yo voy a ver un poco cómo ya la hice, pero. Eso se me va a ir un poquito más que los, los osteocornios que dice ahí. Ella ayer fue practicando, ya lo he visto. De repente, tener una cama en esta cama se hace bien. Hey, good. How are you? Yeah, we run that through a different system. We may have to rethink that. I don't know. Well, I thought we had to. So we do. Yeah, we do, but it's just going to complicate it for them. Correct. On sale.
کمی Let's go to foot care. Page 84. Care plan on page 84 tells us to provide foot care to one foot using soap and water. How many are we doing? One foot. Do we care if they have two? No. No, no don't care. You get to pick which one. The resident is sitting in a chair and their sock and shoes could be replaced at the end of the scale. Let me explain to you why it says this. Most of your care plans are not going to say this. Um, if you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that this is going to be done on a live testing individual. So most of you guys aren't taking clean socks in to the testing center with you. You don't have clean socks. So in a clinical setting, if you're doing foot care on somebody, clean feet deserve clean socks. You would put clean socks on them. But for the test, we don't have clean socks. So that's why it says replace their sock and shoe at the end of the scale. Okay. So this care plan is very specific to the test. Most of your care plans out there won't require that. So we have um, a couple of things to talk about with this. This is a washing skill. Do you guys remember hand and nail care that we learned? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? This mm -hmm. is hand and nail care, just lower. You, you've already seen this, right? Mm -hmm. um, the only difference is with hand and nail care, we actually did stuff with the nails. We cleaned under them, we filed them, right? We did mm -hmm. stuff with the nails. With foot care, we're not doing anything with nails. We're just looking at them. Because podiatrists will come in and uh, take care of any foot issues, including nail trimming and grinding down and what you know, whatever else needs to be done. They just need to know that the patient needs to be seen hmm. by them. So the way this works is the care plan tells you to do foot care. You do foot care. You look for any abnormalities. You report them to the nurse. 
the nurse puts them on the podiatry list, and when the podiatrist comes in, the issue gets addressed. Okay, so that's why we're doing foot care. We're looking for does the patient have something that needs to be addressed? So a big part of this skill is going to involve observation and reporting. Big part of the skill. So for this particular skill, one of the things that they want to see is you physically looking at the foot. And it's not just enough to look at it. You need to say, I'm looking at the foot. <laughs> I'm looking for any abnormalities. I don't see any red areas, something like that that lets them know that you understand that's why you're there. Good? Other than that, this is a washing skill. We do our opening, we get a barrier. In this case, barrier will go on the floor, not the table, because feet mm -hmm. can't go on the table. Um, so I put the barrier on the floor. We're gonna get our, our uh, supplies, put them on the floor. We're gonna get our base in the water. We'll check it, they'll check it. We're going to soak the foot, take it out, put it on a towel to wash. Remember, soak goes on the washcloth. Mm -hmm. Put it back in the basin to rinse, take it out, put it on the towel to dry, just like we did with hand care. And you will wash between the toes, you will rinse between the toes, you will dry between the toes, you will not lotion between the toes. Because lotion holds a moisture, and that's going to make it, first of all, feel very squishy, which is, you know, ugh. But it's also going to hold in moisture. And now you've got warm, dark, moist. And that's how we get athlete's foot. Fungus grows there. So no lotion between the toes. Good? Mm -hmm. Questions? I have a question. So there's like this one patient. I was in the room. Mm -hmm. And she was on her side. So she asked me, can you fix that? I said, I can't. Let me go get a CNA for you. But in, after she said that, she's like, I need help. I need help. Nobody's coming to help me. I'm like, I'm in dietary. I can't help you. Oh. And if I was trained to do it, then I can be able to do it. I felt so bad. I started crying because. Aw, because somebody needed help and you weren't able to provide it. Yeah. What do I do with that step? You need to go let the nurse know. That, that's really your only option because you can't step outside of your scope of practice. Um, so if you're working in dietary, you don't have the um, authority to work on the patient, you know, to, to assist the patient. So you need to let the nurse know. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a heartbreaking situation when you want to help, the patient needs the help, but you can't give the yeah. help. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. I'm sorry you had to deal with that. I'm sorry that nobody was coming to help the patient. That's really the, the problem. Well, it's like that new place on 50, Oakdale St. Eleven. It's that new place. Nobody they have my CNAs. Like, mm -hmm. I want to get into the hospital, then come back to that place and work in there to try to get the help people need. Right. Right. But it was heartbreaking. Yeah. I can imagine. And then I called my mom up and told my mom, Mom, I don't know what to do. Yeah, just let the nurse know. Okay. Yep. Okay, so with this particular, so the care plan is really short here. It just tells us to provide foot care with soap and water to one foot. So this is gonna be really, really similar to hand and nail care. If you look at the step involved in both, in nail care, we supported the wrist and arm at all times, while foot care will support the foot at all times. Uh, hand and nail care, we soak the hand in water. Or foot care, we're going to soak the foot in water. Um, wash, rinse, dry, once the wash, rinse, dry. I mean, it's, it's very, very similar. Where we get into a, a difference is that we're not going to clean under the nails or um, file the rough edges on the feet. So the we took care of the nails for hand and nail care. We're not going to do that for the feet. Specific to the feet though, we're not gonna put lotion between the toes. That's gonna to be one of our, our hallmarks here. We wanna inspect all surfaces for wounds, sores, rashes, red areas, that type of thing. And we don't wanna put bare feet directly on the floor. Well, that just makes sense. So you wanna have the barrier there, towel on the barrier to support the foot is really what we're looking for. We'll replace the sock, but when we do that, we want to make sure that we're removing the wrinkles. 
Um, some people can get really sloppy with this. They just kind of put the sock on and then the patient kind of gets this whole bunched up thing going on. Make sure that you're removing the wrinkles. Everything is nice and smooth and the sock is in the right orientation, right? The heel is over the heel. Mm -hmm. It amazes me how many people don't pay attention to small details like that. Um, you know, when they're trying to dress somebody else, you know, the heel needs to be over the heel. And then we want to apply and secure the shoe over the sock um, because anytime a patient's feet hit the floor, we talk about their shoes and that's where we're going next is shoe rules. So we're going to touch on this. We're not going to get to all of it, but we are going to touch on this principle. We're going to learn more on Monday as well. But we have a, a saying, if patients feet hit the floor, we talk about their shoes. Slipper socks are not enough. Okay. So have you ever um, been a patient in a hospital? Anybody ever been a patient mm -hmm. in a hospital? Right. They put you in a hospital gown. Mm -hmm. They give you those little slipper socks and you put them on mm -hmm. and you're super happy because now you're wearing the uniform of a patient. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody loves free socks. Right. But we don't really stop to think about that very much. When you were a patient and you were up or, you know, you were at the hospital, did you walk anywhere in those slipper socks? Mm -hmm. Where'd you walk? To the bathroom. To the bathroom. Yeah. So do bathrooms have, I don't know, germs? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me give you an example that will make sense to you. Let's say that I went and had my gallbladder out this morning. It was same day surgery. I was supposed to go home at the end of the day, right? You go in early morning, they do the surgery, you stay there and recover, and then they send you on your way, you can go home. But unfortunately, my blood pressure was up, so they didn't let me go home. I had to stay in the hospital overnight for observation. So I'm in a hospital gown, little slipper socks, and they give me this bed. Oh, that bed over there. So I go lay down in the bed and I'm flipping through TV and there's nothing wrong with me. My blood pressure is just a little wonky. I can still walk and feed myself and do all the stuff I need to do. They're just taking vital signs, giving me medication. So I'm stuck in bed, listening to the TV, flipping through stations, and eventually I got to pee. So I get up with my little slipper socks on. I walk to the bathroom and I walk back to the bed and I get back into bed. What I didn't tell you about was my roommate. So my roommate here is in her 80s. She had a hip replacement surgery and um, a couple days ago, and she developed an infection in her incision. So they've got her on IV antibiotics, and they're not doing so good with her tummy, and they gave her diarrhea. Now, she is stuck in bed because she had a hip replacement. She hasn't been able to get up and move around yet. So she's got diarrhea in bed. Never a good situation for anybody. But the CNAs are pretty good. They come in, they change her sheets, and they get everything cleaned up. But they didn't listen to the lecture on don't put dirty sheets on the floor, right? So when they changed the sheets, they just threw them on the floor. And when I walked to the bathroom and then back, I walked right through the area that had soiled sheets on the floor. So what climbed into bed with me? when I put my feet in the bed. Okay, everything. Yeah. Now I have four little tiny incisions. They're only about that big, but they're all over my abdomen where they did the laparoscopic surgery. So four little tiny incisions and incisions are the ideal warm, dark, moist areas of the body. And because, you know, there's no real defense system there. They're man-made. So all of those germs that are now in bed with me can very easily move up the sheets because as my feet kick and I turn and I toss and I move around, it moves those pathogens up closer to the, the top of my body. So if those pathogens are able to get into those incisions, what am I going to end up with? An infection. Pretty gross, right? Considering I know where that infection came from. Mm -hmm. Pretty gross. Slipper socks do not protect against contamination. And that's something that most people don't think about. I go down to the hospital down the road and they got a subway on the first floor. Mm -hmm. And it amazes me. Every time I go there, there is a patient in a gown in subway. That means that they walked all 
the way downstairs, down the hallway, went to the restaurant and then walked all the way back up. And they're going to get into bed with those slipper socks on. What else is going to get into bed with them? Yeah. Every single germ they encounter. Everyone. So slipper socks are not enough. You need to have shoes on, but even worse than that. So that's bad. I mean, that, that's pretty bad. I don't know about you, but I really don't want to cuddle up to a nice case of <laughs> Giardia or C. diff, you know, in my bed. But it's worse than that. And I'm going to give you a story about this. Um, years and years ago, I was an agency nurse. Now, do you remember in high school when your teacher couldn't show up, they sent in a sub? Mm -hmm. You guys remember that? Well, that's what agency nurses are. They're substitute nurses. It's when the regular nurses can't show up at the facility, they get a, a substitute, which is an agency. So I go into this building as an agency nurse and I'm on the rehab side. That, that's where I was assigned, the rehab side. So this is short term, right? Mm -hmm. People with immediate problems are getting therapy, short wound care, that kind of thing, short term. Three months or less. So I go in and I get my report for the day. I know who I've got to see, what I've got to do, and I start making my rounds. And I go into this one room and the light is off in the room. Just one small light above the bed, like right here, just one small fluorescent light above the bed was on. I walk in the room and I flip on the light and I say, hi, Henry, I'm Patty, you're, you're a nurse today. How are you? And he starts yelling right away, turn it off, turn it off. And I'm like, oh, okay, turn the light off. And I walk up to the bed and I, is there a reason you don't want the light on? Do you have a headache or do you not feel well? What's going on? He says, no, no, I've got retinopathy from my diabetes and it makes um, bright lights hurt my eyes. Oh, okay. So I stood there and talked to him for a few minutes. I got a couple a cup of pills in my hand and I'm talking to him, kind of doing a little assessment while I'm standing there. I'm catching an odor. Now, if you've ever smelled a wound, they're very distinctive, right? So I, I know that a patient has a wound just by being around them because I can smell it. And I look, as I'm talking to him, I'm catching this odor. I pick up my report sheet and I'm looking as we're talking and there is nothing about a wound. No wound care orders, no assessment, nothing. Uh oh. So I now have to look for the wound. And I tell him, hey, Henry, I think you might have a wound brewing somewhere. Can I take a quick peek? He says, do what you gotta do. He's a very gruff guy in his 50s. Do what you got to do. So I look at all the usual suspects. I look at the tips of the ears, the shoulder blades, the lower back or coccyx area, the back of his knees, and I move down. I'm not finding anything really significant. I get down to his feet and he's got their slipper socks on. So I said, Henry, I need to take your socks off for a second to take a look. And he immediately yells, no. Now, okay, I know where my problem is, because if he's telling me no, that means that he told the CNAs no. So we have no idea how long it's been since anybody looked at his feet. No clue. So I turn up the charm, because you can always get further with patients by being charming than being mean. So I turn up the charm, and I get him to, I convince him to let me take his socks off. So I took the, the left sock off and the foot was a little bit flaky, definitely could have used some lotion and, and some foot care, but it wasn't in bad shape. I tried to take the right sock off and it stuck to the bottom of his foot. Ooh. Found it. Ooh. There's my problem. So I get a basin of warm salt water. We call it normal saline. I put the whole foot in it, sock and all, because I got to loosen it up to be able to get the sock off to see what I'm working with. So about 10 minutes later, I come back in the room. And uh, I'm working with the patient. I'm going to take the sock off. And as I do, something falls off his foot. Sock came off, but something fell off his foot. So now I have to go looking to find out what fell off his foot. Well, all of his toes were still there. That was a good thing. So I start looking around, and this is what I find. It's one of those flat, metal, white, painted thumbtacks. Hmm. Not this exact one. 
but he had one of these stuck in the bottom of his foot. And he ended up with a wound that was about this big around, hard black dead tissue. Now, we're really good in medicine. I mean, we are really good in medicine. We can heal a lot of things, but dead is dead. And we're not Dr. Frankenstein. We can't bring stuff back from the dead, right? Dead is dead. So I knew this guy is in a heap of trouble because that's dead tissue on the bottom of his foot. So I call the doctor, I get wound care orders, I call the wound care specialist, I notify the family, I take the pictures, I write everything up, write up the care plan, the whole nine yards, and then I leave. Not my facility, not my patient. But this guy stayed on my mind for a long time. About nine, ten months later, I get assigned back to that facility. This time I'm on the long-term care side, and I see his name on my list. So I walked in and said, hey, Henry, I'm Patty. I'm the nurse that found the wound on your foot. How are you doing? And as I said that, he pulled the sheet aside and he had had to have a below the knee amputation. Mm -hmm. He lost his leg because of this. Now he was only in his 50s. This was tragic. And now he can't even go home. He's on long-term care. And it could have been prevented. That's the real tragedy. The whole thing could have been prevented. If, if he had been wearing shoes, where would the thumbtack be? On his shoe. Shoe. Mm -hmm. We don't amputate shoes. When you have a diabetic patient, you have to make sure that their feet are protected. But I know some of you are going, well, wait, 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 hold up. How did this guy have a thumbtack in the bottom of his foot and not know it was there? I mean, come on. Is this real? Yes, it is. And let me explain to you why. So we have to talk about diabetes. Remember when I first went in the room, he wanted the light off because he had retinopathy from his diabetes. And um, diabetes played a huge part in this story. And in order to understand why, I've got to teach you a little bit about diabetes, just a little bit. Okay, this is fifth grade diabetes. So I'm super simplifying this for you, okay? But let me explain to you what happens. So in our body, we have cells, trillions and trillions and trillions of cells, and those cells need fuel to run. So the most common fuel is sugar, and we get sugar from the food that we eat. The carbohydrates that we eat all break down into sugar. That sugar then enters the cell. The cell then has energy to run. So pretty simple process. Carbs get a bad rap in our society. Carbs are not bad. Carbs are good. Carbs provide the cells the energy they need to run. Carbs in excess are bad. So if you eat too many carbs, they're bad. Because the problem is, that when you eat carbs, your body can only use so much, and then whatever's left has it. We have to do something with it. You can't excrete it. You don't pee out excess sugar. It has to go somewhere. So what the body does is it puts that excess sugar in little boxes, tapes up the boxes, puts it in a storage unit that we call fat cells. So your fat cells actually store excess sugar in the form of glycogen, which is the box. So we take the sugar, put it in a box, that becomes glycogen. The glycogen, or box, then goes into storage unit. And then later on in life, if you should need some excess energy, oh, we can go into the storage unit and unpack some glycogen, and we can use that. But, you know, it has a shelf life. So, unfortunately, if you've got a lot of fat cells that are all full, by the time we get around to using some of that glycogen, it can be really old and not very effective. And this is why when you get to a certain point, it's really hard to lose weight because the stuff that's in the storage unit can't really be used. So it's hard to get rid of it. Remember, you can't excrete it. Mm -hmm. Starting to see how that works. Okay. All right. So our body takes in carbs, breaks those down into sugar, and then the sugar feeds the cells. Is that in this book? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. No. Yeah, so you can rewatch this. 
The problem is that that sugar can't just enter the cell all by itself because those, those cells have doors and the doors are locked. So when you eat carbs, it breaks down into sugar, the sugar goes into the bloodstream. In order to get into the cells, it's got to unlock the door so it can get in. Well, we actually happen to have a factory built right in that produces keys to unlock the door. And that factory is your pancreas. So when you eat carbs, the brain tells the pancreas, hey, we need some keys. Pancreas says on it, makes some keys, puts them into the bloodstream. And then now we have the ability to unlock the cell for the sugar to enter. Good? Okay. So that's how this works. You eat carbs, your pancreas produces insulin. Insulin goes into the bloodstream along with the sugar. Then the cells can get opened and the sugar can go in and everybody's happy. Where this process breaks down, so this is exactly what I just told you. Okay, this is a graphic about it. The cell is hungry. We eat carbs for extended sugar. The pancreas produces a key to open the door. The door is open. The sugar enters the cell. The cell is happy. Well fed. The problem is that if our body doesn't produce insulin, it doesn't matter how many carbs we eat, the cells don't ever get fed. So the cell says, I'm starving. We eat some carbs. Sugar goes in the bloodstream, but there's no key. So that sugar just stands outside the door and it can't get in. The cell is still starving, so we eat more carbs. That sugar still can't get in. The cell is still starving, so we eat more carbs, but that sugar can't get in. What do you think is going to happen to that cell over time? It's going to die. die. Absolutely. So all the sugar it needs, oops, all the sugar it needs, um, but none of it can get into the cell. This is what happens with diabetes. Because when you're diabetic, the process still works. You still eat carbs, it still breaks down into sugar, it still goes into the bloodstream, that, that part still works. The problem is that the pancreas doesn't produce keys, it doesn't produce insulin. Or in some types of diabetes, it produces keys, but it's giving us car keys and we need house keys. It doesn't do us a bit. It may be key, it may be insulin, mm -hmm. but it's not the right kind of insulin to allow that sugar to enter the cell. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. That's insulin resistant diabetes. So this is, like I said, an extremely simplified version of diabetes. It's way more complex than this. This is the fifth grade overview, right? Three things I need you to take out of this, take with you from this, okay? Number one is that cells cannot use the sugar, the, the fuel, unless there is insulin present, okay? So that's number one. The pancreas produces insulin. Number two is that sugar cannot be excreted. We either use it or we store it. There is no third option. Okay. And number three, cells that are starving produce cravings because they're starving. That makes sense, right? Those are the three things that I need you to remember about diabetes. Let's talk about number three real quick. Anybody ever know a diabetic? Most people know a diabetic because diabetes is gaining in numbers. Um, within 10 years, I think it's something like 50% of the population, close to 50% of the population have diabetes. Is there something? Yeah. I guess. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, above age 50. Let me, let me oh. predicate that. Yeah, it's, um, when I got a, a type of diabetes, diabetes, and I sugar, and I gained uh, too many pounds. Mm -hmm. And I, I was heavy, it's like a 260 pounds. And the insulin is not working for my sugar. It's always high. And usually I don't eat nothing. I control my carbs and everything, but it's nothing work. And my doctors later and found a little tumor 
and my pinky carry gland. Yeah, your pituitary, yeah. Yeah, so this is not working together with my um, uh, thyroid. Mm -hmm. So they block a little bit, so my, my, my liver don't produce any insulin. They block everything. So since I got a surgery for that and remove the tumor and I start losing weight, right now I'm losing 90 pounds. Wow, very good, very so good. So I don't take yeah. insulin and not take Like anything. I said, this is a very simplified version. There's a lot more that goes into it. Your pituitary mm -hmm. plays a part, your liver plays a part. There's a lot of other things that go. I don't mm -hmm. want to overcomplicate this. I know. I'm, I'm trying to make it very simple overview for you guys to understand just general diabetes. But let me explain to you why diabetics, um, and they all have this one trait, diabetics crave sugar. That's the one thing they can't have, right? We know their blood sugar is high. We tell them, don't eat sweets. Cut down on your sugar. Drink more water. Do more exercise. Don't eat sweets. And yet diabetics are usually the ones that hide the bag of eminence under their pillow. There's a very good reason for that. Their cells are starving. Their cells are literally dying. Dying. Their brain only knows one solution. If my cells need fuel, then clearly I need more sugar. Right? This the, the brain doesn't know that there's plenty of sugar on board. We got more sugar than we know what to do with. It just can't get into the cells. The brain doesn't know that. The brain just knows cells are starving. I must need sugar. sugar. This is why diabetics crave sweets. They crave it. And don't get mad at them. They're responding to a very real crisis inside their body. It's real. It's not imaginary. It's not a lack of willpower has nothing to do with that. It's the fact that their cells are dying and they, their brain has to do something about it. But there's something that most people don't know. On the back of the cell, I say the back, it, it's really not. But this cell, we see the front door. That one is unlocked by insulin. We can't do anything about that because a patient has diabetes, we don't have any key. But on the back of the, the cell is a small door, much smaller than this one. That one can be opened with protein. So it's not as effective, doesn't work as well, but it does work. So if we have a patient who's diabetic and craving sugar, don't tell them you can't have sugar because that doesn't do any good, right? If you say, okay, if you're going to eat sugar, if you're going to eat carbs, pair it with a protein. That way, we can get some fuel inside the cells by using that protein door. So what I tell my diabetic patients is, okay, when you really need that handful of M&Ms, um, have a spoonful of peanut butter too. Have a half a tuna fish sandwich. So you have tuna, which is protein, and bread, which is carbs. Have an apple with cheese. Pair protein with carbs, and that helps cut down on the cravings. Because now the cells are getting fed. It's not as effective, but it's helpful. And it helps prevent all of the sugar from continuing to um, circulate in the, the um, circulatory system. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Telling a person who is literally dying that they can't have something is stupid. They're not going to listen to you. The, the need for survival is going to totally overrun anything you have to say. So telling that diabetic patient you can't have those M&Ms, they don't care. They're not going to listen to you. Why would they? Their cells are dying. But if you explain to them, okay, this is why you're craving m &Ms. Your cells are starving. That's real. It's not imagined. That's real. That is a real threat to your body right now. So if you tell them, okay, yeah, you're craving, and that's normal, but if you pair it with a protein that cuts down on the cravings, and your cells now get fed, 
your patients will actually start making better decisions. Right? Okay. But the problem with diabetes is not so much that the cells are dying. I mean, that's a problem. Yes, it is a problem. But that's not the real problem with diabetes. This is the real problem with diabetes. Because remember I said that that sugar either has to be used or stored, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you do when all your storage units are full? We can't excrete it, so that means that this blood sugar is circulating round and 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 round. And round. That's a problem. So now you've got crystals because sugar is a crystal, right? Sugar is a crystal like this. See how rough and jagged that is, mm -hmm. right? Imagine that circulating on the inside of your arteries. Over time, it's gonna stop circulating, just kind of settle on the inside <laughs> of an artery. Have you ever seen a cupcake or a cake left out on a counter for a couple of days? What happens to the frosting? It's hard. It's hard, right? Mm -hmm. That is what's inside the arteries of your diabetic patients. The sugar just circulates round and round and eventually it's gonna settle. And that's gonna make the inside of the arteries hard. Do you remember blood pressure we learned on Monday, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when the heart squeezes, it pushes out a wave of blood and that wave of blood moves through mm -hmm. the circulatory system, remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if your arteries are hard? That wave can't expand the artery. Right? So we end up with high blood pressure. That's a problem. So our diabetic patients often have high blood pressure because the inside of the arteries are all stiff from cake frosting. And, you know, I mean, it's glucose, but mm -hmm. that's what it looks like is cake frosting. Now, crystals are jagged. So it's settled on the inside of the arteries. You've got these jagged pieces sticking out. So it's mm -hmm. going to catch everything that's floating by, like cholesterol. And cholesterol looks like pizza cheese on the inside of your arteries, legitimate pizza mm -hmm. cheese on the inside of your arteries. So now you've got this pizza cheese all bound up inside your frosting. <coughs> so you think these arteries are looking pretty good right now? Mm -hmm. No, that's a problem. That's a problem. So when we're born, our arteries look something like this. This is a nice artery. I would love for my arteries to look like that again. It doesn't, I can tell you. But over time, we mess this up. Now, I need you to understand that the American diet is what is responsible for most of this. And it doesn't start at 60, it starts at two. Let me explain to you why. Remember, carbs break down into sugar. sugar. Okay, so follow me here. Child gets up at six o'clock in the morning. Mom's not quite ready to get up that early. So mom lays down on the couch, hands child a Pop-Tart and turns on cartoons. So mom can kind of nap a bit before she's ready to get up. So Pop-Tarts are carbs that break down into sugar and it makes the insulin or it makes the pancreas produce Thank insulin God. right so mom gets up finally around 7 7 30 and gets a child a bowl of cereal now children do not eat raisin bran what do they eat lucky yeah, fruity pebbles lucky mm -hmm. charms and those are all carbs with high sugar content that breaks down into yeah. sugar and the pancreas then has to produce mm -hmm. insulin for it to be used so now we get to mid-morning and it's time for a snack. And mom's a good mom. She gives the child fruit, but fruit is a carb that breaks down into sugar, sugar making the pancreas produce sugar. insulin. Lunchtime, we're going to have the great toddler American meal of chicken nuggets and mac and cheese, which has a little protein in it, but it's mostly carbs that break down into sugar and makes the pancreas produce yeah. insulin. Mid-afternoon, of course, we're going to get a little Debbie snack, some sort of a snack cake or sweet treat to hold us over till dinner. So that means that 
those carbs are going to break down into sugar, sugar which makes the insulin the pancreas produce mm -hmm. insulin. Mm -hmm. Dinner is going to be spaghetti and a salad with a good dressing, right? Mm -hmm. And that spaghetti is carbs, carbs, which breaks down into mm -hmm. sugar and makes the pancreas produce mm -hmm. insulin. This goes on from age two to 92. Our American diet is heavy in carbs, very heavy in carbs. Every time you eat a carb, it makes your pancreas produce insulin. By the time you get to 50, your pancreas is like, I'm done, I'm out. In, end of game. I'm not working anymore. You have overused me. This is not a sudden, and a lot of the older patients that get diagnosed with diabetes are like, this came out, out of nowhere. No, it didn't. It started when you were two. You have overused your pancreas. And now it's just plain quit. This is not a sudden problem. This has its roots in your lifestyle habits all throughout your life. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So once we get into our 20s, having this type of a, um, a diet, our blood vessels look a little bit more like this. And you can see that it's narrowed and we're getting a little bit of a buildup there. If we don't change, if we continue our eating habits, then we're going to end up like this in our 40s. It's a whole lot of buildup. Now, the real problem here is if I get injured, there's not a whole lot of area here for good, healthy blood to come heal whatever's wrong with me. I've reduced the amount of blood that's circulating. Now, remember, when blood slows or stops, it clots. That's what it does. So if I don't do anything here, this is a warning sign. I have high blood pressure. I have delayed healing. I have symptoms here. I probably have some diabetes here. If I don't look at the warning signs and change some things, then I'm going to end up with this. This is the problem with diabetes, is that this is what we end up with. When blood slows down or stops, it clots. clots. That means that no blood is going to get past this place. If this happens in my brain, it's a stroke. If it happens in the small blood vessels feeding my heart muscle, it's a heart attack. Do you see why this is a problem? Mm -hmm. Can that be reversed um, with your diet or only by surgery? There's no surgery to reverse. Oh, okay. No surgery. So that can't because be. blood vessels like a tree. Okay, think of a tree. You got a big trunk. You got smaller branches. Then you got twigs, right? So if if we were to try to push that out, we might be able to push things through the big trunk. We might be able to push things through the small branches, but when we get out to the twigs, there's nowhere for it to go. So there's no surgery we can do here to clean out all those blood vessels. This is why 15 minutes of cardio exercise a day is good, because think of it like a drain, right? That blood moving rapidly, forcefully through the blood system moves things along, but we can't do it through a surgery. That's why you should do cardio every day. It moves things through your blood vessels a lot more effectively. But, okay, we have gravity on planet Earth. We've talked about that, right? So remember that our blood vessels get smaller the further away they get from the heart. You can see that here, right? Our blood vessels near the heart, they're big. But as they go, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and then they become capillaries, which are like hair. 
And that's where all of the, the exchange takes place, mm -hmm. is in the capillaries. So things get smaller. But because we have gravity here on planet Earth, that means all of this heavy stuff, these crystals, are going to get pulled to the lowest points of our body because they're heavy. So what's the lowest point of my body? What's the lowest point of my upper body? Diabetics will have problems with hands and feet. Mm. Hand and nail care, foot care. You see why we're doing these two skills? Mm -hmm. Now, it gets even worse. That's not bad enough, right? Mm -hmm. It gets even worse. Because that sugar doesn't just affect the arterial system. It will also affect your nerves. That sugar can coat the nerves. So we are wired individuals. We're not wireless, right? If I stub my toe, there is a physical line, a nerve, that goes from my toe, up my leg, through my body, up through my neck, into my brain, that connects and says, hey, you stubbed your toe. It is a physical line that that signal has to travel up. Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody go with that? Mm -hmm. So if I have sugar that's coating that nerve, that signal will not make it. It interrupts the signal. It can't go past. It's like a, a power line that's coated with ice. Uh, we don't have that problem here in Florida, but mm -hmm. up north in a blizzard, you can have a power line that's coated with ice and you'll get brownouts and, and mm -hmm. power uh, outages because the signals can't travel. Same thing here with diabetes, you can have this overwhelming um, interruption of signal and it happens predominantly in the feet and the hands. And we have a term for this, it's called neuropathy. And you'll end up with, the patients with neuropathy end up with this like pins and needles feeling. Feels like a million fire ants crawling on your legs. Um, and that's because the signals are being interrupted. So this is how Henry had a, a thumbtack in the bottom of his foot that had no idea it was there because the signal was interrupted. And because he had diabetes, he couldn't get good feeling blood to the area. And that's why it died. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you have a, just a vague understanding of this? Mm -hmm. Very vague. Okay. This diabetes, you can get like a master's degree in that because it is so complex. There are so many things involved in this that we just scratched the surface. All right. So. When we are doing foot care on a patient, this is the main reason that we're doing foot care is to actually look at that foot to see, is there anything here that maybe the patient isn't aware of that needs to be addressed? And so that's why for the test, you need to say something out loud, like I'm looking at the foot or I don't see any abnormalities. You need to say something. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna show you the video for this one because I am not getting on the floor. I'll never get back up. Me, that is the hardest part of this particular skill. All the same washing rules apply. So there's not much here that's unusual for you that you won't recognize. So I get this whole skill done in six minutes and 25 seconds.
Instagram, Sunny and Sun. I'm just Sunny today. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Sunny? Wonderful. I'm keeping you put here. Is that okay? Yes. Let me go close your curtains, wash my hands, and then I'll gather your supplies. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get a barrier and we'll place this on the floor. Right in front of you, and you can place your foot on the barrier. I'm going to get a basin, soap, and lotion. Place that on the barrier. I'm going to get two washcloths and a towel and a set of gloves. I'm going to get some water to wash. Mr. Jones, would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? Yes. Good. Yeah. Good. Very good. I'm going to set this here. Then I'm going to kneel on the barrier and apply my gloves. And roll up your pants leg and lift your foot so I can remove your sock. We'll place your foot in the basin to soak. I'll take the first washcloth and wring it out, making sure that your foot is wet. I'm going to place your foot over here on the towel and apply soap to the washcloth. I'm going to wash all surfaces of the foot. I'm going to lift your foot up so I can wash the bottom. And I'll observe for any red areas, wounds, sores, or any other abnormalities. We'll put your foot back in the basin to rinse. Okay, I'm going to place your foot on the towel to dry. I'm sure all surfaces have been dried thoroughly. I'll take one of the narrow edges and go between your toes to blot. And I'll dry the bottom of your foot. Now I'm going to apply some lotion. We warm the lotion in our hands. Apply lotion to all surfaces except between your toes. So I'm going to lift your foot. And we'll apply lotion to the bottom as well as the top. And now I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion so that you don't slip. Okay, go ahead and put your foot back on the barrier. And now I can reapply the towel. <coughs> Okay, Mr. Jones, I need to put all of my supplies away now. I'm going to gather my dirty linen and place it in the dirty linen hamper. I'm going to take the basin to the sink and clean according to the basin cleaning procedure. On the way back, I'll collect the soap and the lotion and put the basin back in the hole. Now I'll collect the barrier and throw it away. 
Now I can remove my books. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is here. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. Can I get your magazine while you're waiting? No, thank you. I'm going to open my curtains and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator if my skill is done. Questions? No. Book hair actually is a, a really easy skill once you get through all of the stuff I have to tell you about it, you know, the diabetes mm -hmm. and all that. All right, moving on. Okay, we're going to go to, um, and we're going to come back to shoe rolls a little bit later on Monday. Um, I've got a lot more to tell you. We've only gone over about half of that principle. There's more that you're going to have to learn, but we're not going to cover it today. So we're going to move on to page 106. So this is assisting a resident that needs to use a bedpan. Our care plan at the top of the page says the resident has requested a bedpan. The resident is not wearing undergarments and is able to wipe self. The resident is able to move as directed. Now let me explain to you why the care plan says this for the test. If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that this is going to be done on a live testing student. That means that one of you may find yourself sitting on a bedpan for the test. You're not actively going to use it. You're not going to be undressed. The reason the care plan says that they're not wearing undergarments and they can wipe their self is because they don't want anyone trying to take your clothing off. For the test, you would be put in the bed wearing your clothing with a hospital gown over it. Okay. We don't want anybody trying to take your clothes off or trying to get in your personal space to clean up. The evaluators now can say that is not what the care plan says. Got it? Mm -hmm. This is going to be a simulation skill. Nobody's actually peeing at a bedpan. You're going to pretend that there's urine in the bedpan. The skill really doesn't have much to do with the bedpan. It has more to do with the head of the bed, believe it or not. Um, and let me explain to you why that would be. Okay, so let's say that I have a patient who's laying in bed. Here's my patient laying in bed. Patient needs to use a bedpan. Bedpan. If I put the bedpan underneath the patient's bottom, what does it do to their bottom? Raises it. Raises it up. How many of you ladies can pee uphill? Uh -uh. Now, even more importantly, if you are man able to manage to push out a little pee, it's going to go right up your back and into your hair. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but that's pretty high on my gross meter. So when you put a bedpan under a patient, you have to get them into a sitting position. That is the only position you can use a bedpan in. Especially important if you're going to have a bowel movement, because we do rely on gravity to help us out with, with removing solid waste. So if you just put a bedpan under a patient's bottom and think you're done, you're not done. Patient's not going to be able to go. So bedpan under and then head of the bed up. Now they're sitting on the bedpan, pressing it down into the bed. You can't get it out from under them. You've got to put the head of the bed back down in order to take that bedpan out. So this skill has everything to do with the head of the bed. Otherwise, it's not going to be effective. Make sense? Mm -hmm. But with all of that moving of the head of the bed up and down, whatever's in that bed pan is going to slosh around a little bit. So what can we put on the bed to help protect it? A chuck. A chuck's a barrier. Absolutely. 
So for this scale, the chucks goes on the bed, the bedpan goes on the chucks. Head of the bed goes up. Give them their toilet paper and call light. When they're done, head of the bed goes down. We're gonna take the bedpan and chucks out together because we don't wanna carry an open container of urine through a room. That's just gross, right? So we're gonna take the bedpan and the chucks out together. That way we can wrap the chucks over the bedpan and transport it to the bathroom. Nobody needs to see what's in there. Good, mm -hmm. questions? So this skill really doesn't have much to do with the bedpan. The other issue with this is infection control though. So our care plan says the patient is not wearing undergarments. That means we have a bare bottom. We're putting a chucks on the bed under a bare bottom. Is a bare bottom personal skin? Mm -hmm. So what do we need to wear? Gloves. gloves. Now you have butt juice gloves on. Do you want to touch that bed controller to put the head of the bed up yeah. with butt juice gloves? So what do you need to do? Take them off. Take the gloves off, put the head of the bed up, give them their call light and toilet paper. We're gonna step on the other side of the curtain. We're not going anywhere. We have no other patients. It's a test. There's one patient in your life. There's nowhere to go. You're not gonna wash your hands. You're not gonna do anything. You're just gonna stand on the other side of the curtain and wait for them to say they're done. In a clinical setting, you're not gonna stand on the other side of the curtain because they don't want an audience. You're gonna wash your hands and leave. In fact, if you can take the other roommate with you, do so. People need privacy, right? Good, okay. Before the test, nowhere to go. So we're just gonna stand there and wait. When they say they're done, we're gonna put the head of the bed down, put new gloves on to take the bed pan and chucks away. So this skill requires two sets of gloves. You guys understand why? Mm -hmm. Um, where do you think urine goes? Does it go in the sink or the toilet? The toilet. Oh, yeah. It's where it normally goes. It's where I'm putting it. So make sure when you empty the pretend urine out of the bedpan, you do so in the right. toilet. Okay. Good? Mm -hmm. Questions? Right, let me explain to you about toileting methods. Bedpan is a last resort. It is literally a last resort. So when I'm the nurse and I'm doing my assessment on the patient, the very first thing I'm going to look at is toileting. That's the first thing, because every patient has to go. Every patient has to go every shift. So I know sometime in my time with this patient, they are going to have to go to the bathroom somehow, some way. I need to figure out how that's going to happen. So my very first option is they're going to go to the bathroom, just like you go to the bathroom. I don't want to be involved in that if I don't have to be. Mm -hmm. So if you can get up and go by yourself, on my care plan, it's going to say bathroom ad lib. That means patient goes when they need to. We are not involved. But maybe the patient's a little weak and steady on medication, something like that, and I think it would be safer if they had somebody help them. That care plan would say bathroom with assist. But there are some situations where the patient can't make it all the way to the bathroom. And now we got to figure out Plan B. So plan A is always they go like normal. Plan B is, well, can we bring a portable toilet over closer to them? A bedside commode. And then they can either use it with or without a cyst. So the care plan may say bathroom at lift means they do it all themselves. Bathroom with a cyst, that means we help out might say bedside commode ad lib, which means they use it all by themselves, we just clean it. Or it could say bedside commode with assist. That means you might have to help them get onto it, clean up, whatever. Good? Mm -hmm. Now, if I can't use those two, uh, bathroom or bedside commode, those are my first two options. Because bedside commode, even though it's right by the bed, it still gives that normal, toilet-like experience. If I can't use either one of those, now I'm in trouble. Now I'm left with very few options. My first question is, is this patient even continent? That means able to hold their urine and feces. If they're incontinent, I got a whole procedure for that. We're just going to clean and change them every two hours around the clock. We'll talk about that later. 
But if they are continent, I now only have two options. They either need a catheter or we're going to use a bed pan. So do you see how I have to go through this whole list just to get the bed pan? Yeah. And did you notice bed pan was last on the list? It's not for choice. It is last on the list. And there's a reason for that. Number one, bed pans are uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable. There's nothing comfortable about a bed pan. But the real problem is there's a psychological restriction here. You have been trained from the time you were this tall, don't pee in the bed. Don't pee in the bed. Don't pee in the bed. And certainly don't poop in the bed. Just because I put a plastic pan under your butt does not mean your brain is going to let you use it. Because your brain knows that you're still in the bed. And those lessons that we learn early in life stick with us. They're deeply ingrained. So this is a problem. Patients with bed pans often require multiple trials just to get some results. So you'll put a bed pan under them, they can't go. You'll take it out. You'll put a bed pan under them, they can't go. You'll take it out. You'll put a bed pan under them, they'll go a little. You'll take it out. And you're going to be doing this dance all day long because the brain doesn't understand that this is the only option available. So we don't like to use bed pans if we don't have to. Now there's another problem with bed pans. They're shallow. So a toilet, you've got a pretty decent amount of space between your undercarriage and the water, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty decent amount of space. Very little splashback going on there. Bed pan, your undercarriage, very close to the bed pan. Now urine comes out under pressure. So you've got liquid under pressure hitting a flat plastic surface. You are going to end up with splashback. And your undercarriage is only this far away. So that means when you are urinating in a bedpan, you are going to get wet. Uncomfortably wet. Seeing how that's going to be a problem? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, but wait, it gets worse. When you go to take that bed pan out and it has a certain amount of urine in it, the bed pans aren't going to hold a whole lot of urine, and that means it's likely to spill as you're removing it. So even though we've got a chucks there, it can um, still spill onto the patient, and you know, it's just pretty high on the gross meter. So bed pans overall are like a last resort. We use them when we absolutely positively have to, but they're not ideal. We can make it a little bit easier on the patient by being patient, by being understanding, by providing privacy whenever possible, as much privacy as possible. We can turn the water on in the bathroom to help with that letdown reflex, and it also helps shield noise, right? We can even use air fresheners if we need to, with the nurse's permission, mm -hmm. to help with any odors if the patient is you know, self-conscious. Good? But it is literally a last resort, not first choice. Any questions on that? Okay. So... In a clinical setting, we have something called a bedpan cleaner. And it looks like a little shower head on the toilet. If you pivot it forward so it's like over the toilet bowl, it'll start spraying. Sometimes you have to hit the flusher. They're all a little bit different. But they'll spray down into the toilet bowl, and it's specifically to clean bedpans. But you have liquid under pressure hitting a flat plastic surface. You have splashback. That means that you may end up with urine or fecal matter on you. Do you want that? Mm -hmm. So you probably need to dress for the job. Mm -hmm. Use a disposable gown over your clothing so you don't get waste products on your clothing. And you want to wear a mask with a face shield so you don't get any of that splash back in any of the holes on your face. So understand that masks don't do anything for odor, by the way. They don't help with odor at all. A lot of people think that they're going to wear a mask to help with it. It doesn't help with odor. 
Um, you can use some Vicks in your nose. You know, the, the stuff mom used to put on your chest when you were a kid. And you can put some of that in your nose and it does help with odors. I can't use Vicks because I've got very sensitive skin and it makes me look like Rudolph. Mm -hmm. Right, my nose will turn bright red. So I would go get that, just the little tiny jars of Vaseline, the really tiny ones, and I would put a couple of drops of essential oil in them. I like lemongrass, um, or sometimes I'll use lavender um, and just mix it in, and then I can use that on my nose, and it does help cut down odor. So it's something that you can use if you need to. So any questions on bedpan cleaners or bedpans in general? All right, there's something else that I want to explain to you about. Um, when you're, you're caring for a patient that's using a bedpan, you really should look at what's in the bedpan before you dump it. Look for color changes, consistency changes, that type of thing, because often we can tell um, things about the patient by their waste products. So if you see anything that's unusual, save it for the nurse. They just put it in the bathroom, cover it up with the chucks, let the nurse know so they can come take a look at it. I've had a lot of CNAs tell me, hey, that, that uh, bowel movement looked really funky. And I'll say, okay, well, where is it? Oh, well, I dumped it. Okay, well, that doesn't help me. Funky is not a medical term. <laughs> I, can't, I can't call up the doctor and say, hey, it looked funky. Funky, how? So I need to see it myself so I know how to describe it so we can figure out the next step. Especially because they may not have another bowel movement for a couple of days. So without motion, you do know that your intestines require movement to work properly. Your patients in bed, they're not moving a whole lot. So what do you think they're gonna suffer from? Yeah, it's very common, very common. Good. Questions? All right, there's two things that you can do with the nurse's permission to make this process so much simpler on everybody. But you have to get the nurse's permission to do both of those things. You're not going to use these on the test. So what I'm about to tell you is not test. Okay? This is in clinical setting. If you take toilet paper and make big loops, big loops, five, six big loops, and you lay it down on the inside of the bedpan, It'll absorb the urine. You get less splashback. You get less sloshing. The patient's more comfortable. And um, generally, it just kind of helps the whole process. But if we're measuring the urine, you can't soak it up with toilet paper first. So if we're measuring the urine, it's called intake and output, you can't use toilet paper. Okay? Mm -hmm. The other thing is bedpans are plastic. They're single patient use. So whatever bedpan I use on this patient, it's only used on this patient. We don't pass them around. So all I have to do is rinse, dry, and store, but bedpans are plastic. When you put a bare bottom, bare skin on plastic, and remember we're 98 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. So that's hot. Mm -hmm. That bedpan is going to stick to the skin, just like you stick to a car seat in shorts in the heat, right? So when you gotta take that bedpan out from under them, it's gonna stick to their bottom and then it's gonna be really hard to remove. If you put a little powder, just sprinkle a little powder on the seat part of the bedpan, it makes it easy to slide under and more importantly, easy to remove after. But we can't use powders if the patient has a respiratory condition or if they have an open wound. But man, if I've got a good patient and I can use toilet paper and, and a powder, oh, it makes this feel so much easier. So much easier. So once we remove the bedpan from the patient, we're going to take it over to the bathroom, unwrap it, dump the pretend urine in the, the um, toilet, rinse the bedpan, dump the rinse water in the toilet as well, dry it, and store it. You don't have to disinfect it for the test. Single patient use, it's only their bedpan. So rinse, dry, store is perfectly okay. But our care plan tells us the patient can wipe themselves. So we know where their hands have been. After we complete this skill, what do you think the patient's gonna need to do before they eat lunch? 
touch their hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to give them a hand wipe to wipe their hands. That step is often missed on the state exam. Because you get so wrapped up in the bedpan part that you forget. But I don't want to eat that tuna salad sandwich with a side of E. coli. All right, so here are our uh, important points. We're gonna put a chucks on the bed and then the bedpan on top of the chucks and make sure that it's underneath the undercarriage of the patient. So if it looks like a toilet seat, you know, the part of the bedpan that's curved looks like a toilet seat, mm -hmm. that's where the butt goes, right? Um, we're going to remove our gloves after we get the bedpan in place, and we're going to raise the head of the bed and give the patient some toilet paper and a call light and let them know to call us when they're done. When they're done, we'll lower the head of the bed, put our new gloves back on, and remove the chucks and the bedpan together. We'll empty the bedpan, rinse, dry, and store the bedpan, give the patient a hand wipe, and do our closing. This patient is going to be uncovered. I mean, they're using a bedpan. So what do we need? Privacy blanket. Privacy blanket. Could you use the sheet? Yeah, you could, but splash back. If the sheets get all dirty, you're going to have to change them. It's a whole thing. You're better off using a privacy blanket. Before I show you the skill, though, I want to go to page 76, please. When you... When you go to work somewhere, wherever the somewhere is, whoever is going off of shift is going to give you report. So you will meet with the CNA that had your patients before you, the shift before you, and they're going to tell you everything you need to know about those patients. It's more or less a verbal care plan, but we call it a report. When you work and your shift is done, you will then give report to the next person coming on and assuming the, the care of those patients. Good? Mm -hmm. All right. The thing about report is that if it's not organized, things can get missed. And CNAs, um, a lot of times will just say, yeah, everybody's fine, and they try to run out the door, and that's not really report. So report should be very regimented. You should get all the information you need about each patient before that shift leaves. And the best way to do that for CNAs is using the team's report. So the first thing we need to know about every patient is toileting. Everybody's going to have to go on our ship. So that's the first thing that we want to address. Bathroom, bedside commode, bedpan, catheter, incontinent. How do they toilet? Next thing I want to know is eating because, again, they will probably eat something every shift. I need to know, are they on fluid restrictions? Do their fluids need to be thickened? Are they on a special diet? Are they NPO? I need to know that. A is for all the other ADLs, bathing, dressing, grooming, socialization, rest, all the other ADLs. M is a special category for mobility, and we, we kind of separate this one out because mobility is important. Somebody on bed rest, if you get them up, you can do damage. Somebody that has to get up, if you don't get them up, they can have complications. So mobility is something that we look at individually. And then S is for special, anything else, like vital signs every two hours, or they are scheduled for a procedure later today, or the family's coming in to take them out on an excursion or whatever. S is for anything that doesn't fall into those categories. If you start doing report this way, it makes it very easy to pass on the information and make sure that you don't miss anything. So toileting, eating, ADLs, mobility, special. I can give report on 12 patients in less than 15 minutes using this process. I mean, a complete report. Now, a lot of places, if it's long-term care, if the patients hardly ever change, they'll actually have this written up on a report sheet. And that's what you see there on the bottom of page 76. Because these patients don't ever change. It's long-term care. 
They were here yesterday, they're here today, they'll be here tomorrow. We don't use these in the hospital because the patients you had yesterday are probably all gone because hospitals change rapidly. Good? Mm -hmm. You guys understand report? This team's report can save your bacon. It's something I highly recommend that you get into the habit of using. Questions on this? All right, let me show you this. I'm going to show you this um, video because it's got really good close ups of placing the bedpan. And if I do this live, you're not going to get to see those close ups from the camera angles. This one, I when I take this skill, and I'm getting ready to tape all the skills again. When I take this skill, this one I do eight times, eight different camera angles. So, and I do the entire skill from eight different camera angles so that you guys can see it really effectively. And that's why I want to show you the video for this one because it really does show all of those things close up. Um, so I just had a question. I know for the test, the patient will be able to wipe themselves. Um, in the case that <clears throat> they're not able to wipe themselves, obviously in a clinical setting, um, do we, do we wipe them before we take the bedpan away? Do we? That's, it's really kind of an individual okay. thing. And it depends, can the patient lift their hips or are we rolling them? Okay. Rolling if the patient, way. yeah, if the patient can lift their hips mm -hmm. off of the bedpan, that's ideal. Mm -hmm. um, but if they can lift, chances are they could clean. They just okay. may not be able to clean effectively. So okay. we're starting out with a cleaner canvas, mm -hmm. right? Um, if the patient has to roll, that means that they probably couldn't do anything on their own. Okay. So if the patient can lift, I'll mm -hmm. clean everything up and then clean them up afterwards. Okay. If the patient has to roll, mm -hmm. I clean before I take the bedpan away. I roll them off of the bedpan, clean, and then take the bedpan. So it really depends. Okay. You will develop your workflow mm -hmm. based on the needs of the patient. Gotcha. I didn't know if we would like put down chucks like double ply so you could take one away with the bedpan and then so that the soiled bottom wasn't on the You sheet. can. Okay. Yes, you can. That That is a, an appropriate action. But like I said, it really depends on what we're working with. Okay. Um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, with larger patients, they may be able to wipe themselves. They just can't get as far as, you know, they may need to. Mm -hmm. So again, it really depends on what I'm working with. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Great question. So there's two ways that we can get a, a bedpan under a patient. If we can ask them to lift their hips and they can, that's the easy way, right? You know, just put the, bed, or the checks there, put the bedpan there, they lower onto the bedpan, they're good to go. Not all patients can lift their hips though. So in that case, we would, um, in that case, Um, we would roll the patient over on their side, put the bedpan under them, roll them back onto the bedpan. When they're done, you want to hold that bedpan flat as you roll them off of it, because otherwise it'll mm -hmm. tip. So it really depends on how we can, um, what the level of ability the patient has. Testing, testing on two two. Why is that not? What's going on with my sound today? Okay. Thank you. 
So that any trailing editor is not consuming the other trailing editor. There you go. Here's your call light. I'm going to put this in 30 minutes. I'll be right back. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Your ad is laid out. Your call light is here. Please let me know if there's anything that we can do. I'm going to open your purse and go wash my hands. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Any questions on that one? No? Okay, let's go to the last skill for today, page 53. It's going to be our first rank with number 10 skill. We have three that we're going to learn. These are by far the easiest skills that we do. All of them are four minutes or less for somebody with your level of experience. But there's a little bit I have to explain to you about what range of motion is and what the exercises are for and what exercises we do. Okay. Go ahead and get started with that. So we're going to read the clear plan at the top page 53 first. Clear plan says provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's left shoulder. Flexion extension and abduction adduction. Provide three repetitions to each exercise and the resident is not able to help with the exercises. If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that the time for this will be four minutes or less. And the person you're doing it on is a live testing student who is laying in the bed. That's important because if you try to do range of motion on the mannequins, you're not going to get the same effect. So when you're going to do this skill for practice, you want to practice on a real person. Okay? Mannequins just don't move like a real person does. Now, First, we have to figure out what we're doing this for. What, why are we doing these exercises? And a lot of people get this mixed up because they think if we're doing exercises in medicine, it must mean that we're trying to get the people better, right? We're trying to improve something. And that's actually not true. We have a whole department that does exercises to improve function. Anybody know what that department is? Therapy. Therapy. Right. Physical fit. Therapy department, that is their job. Now, in order to be a physical therapist, that is a doctorate degree, 10 to 12 years of education. How long are we here? Four weeks. Four weeks. But it can't be us. 10 to 12 years, four weeks. That's not us. Physical therapy assistance, that's a two-year degree, an associate's degree. So two years, four weeks, that is not us. So we do not do exercises to improve function or regain function. CNAs do exercises to retain function, which means we're just trying to keep them from going backwards. We're trying to keep what we've got, not make it better. You guys understand the difference there? So let me give you an example of why this would be important. Okay. We'll talk about Frank. Frank is an elderly gentleman in his early 70s. His wife passed away a couple of years ago. He still lives a very active lifestyle in his own home. Lives cross street in Tever Pines, plays shuffleboard, tennis, um, goes to activities, drives his little golf cart around. He's very, very active. And he and his brother Ralph play tennis every Tuesday and they're super competitive out there on the, the tennis court. And on this particular Tuesday, Frank goes to hit a volley over to Ralph, wails on the ball and feels something in his shoulder give way. And he drops the racket and off to the ER they go. The ER doc, doc says, good news, bad news. 
the bad news is that you tore your right uh, right rotator cuff. And I'm assuming you're right-handed. And he says, yeah, I am. He says, that's bad news. You need surgeons. The good news is the surgeon has an opening tomorrow and can fit you in. And Frank says, sign me up. So he has surgery. And two days later, the discharge planner comes into his room. And she says, we need this bed for other people. You got to go somewhere. You can't stay here while you recover. So we can send you home, but you're going to need some help. You're going to need help with dressing and cooking and eating and showering and all those other things that you're going to have to do. Plus, you have to go to physical therapy and you're not going to be doing any driving. So somebody's going to have to help you with that, too. Do you have anyone at home that can help you with all of those things? He says, no, my wife passed away. My brother still works. I'm on my own. She says, okay, what about a rehab? Rehab has physical therapy right there. You walk down the hallway, get your physical therapy, and they got pretty girls to help you with all the other aims. And he says, sign me up. So on this particular day, he gets admitted to our facility. And as the RN, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do a head-to-toe assessment. I'm looking for real problems and potential problems, right? So um, I know he's got a real problem. He's got a surgery on the right shoulder. So I'm going to ask you to help him with bathing and dressing. I'm going to have you help him with grooming. I'm going to have you help him cut up his meat and open up his milk at meal, meal time, right? We're going to take care of him. Physical therapy is going to do what physical therapy does best. They're going to get him up and running again. So over the six weeks that he's here, you have been helping him with bathing and dressing. You've been helping with grooming. You've been helping with eating. What has that left arm done? Yeah, I haven't done anything. No activity. So what do you think is going to happen to the muscle mass? Yeah. Also, the joint is going to lose mobility. It's going to become stiff. And the technical term is actually a frozen shoulder. So the good news is at the end of six weeks, we fix his right arm right up. The bad news is we broke his left. Did we really help him? No. no. He's in the same condition he came in in, just wrong side. We did not help. So we need to understand that doing no harm is just as important as improving function. So let's go back to the day he came into the facility. And I did my assessment. I looked for real problems and... And I know this is a potential problem. So I'm going to ask you to help him with bathing and dressing, and you're going to help him with grooming, and you're going to help him with cutting his meat and opening his milk. But I'm going to ask you to do range of motion on the left arm. Physical therapy is working on the right. We're not going near that one. You're going to do exercises on the left arm to retain the function that he has. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you need to know what body part you're working on, what exercises you're doing, and how many repetitions we're going to do. Good? You guys mm -hmm. understand why you're doing this? Mm -hmm. Okay, our exercises are, there's only three that CNAs do. That's it. Three. That's why we don't have to go to school for, you know, 12 years to figure this out. We only do three things. Legend extension is up and down. So if I ask you to raise or extend your right hand over your head like you're asking a question, can you extend, bring it all the way up, make it nice and straight, get that elbow straight, and then bring it all the way back down in front of you, right? Let's do it again, all the way up, nice and straight, all the way back down, oh, one more time, come on, all the way up, then all the way back down, all right. So that was actually active range of motion. I told you what to do when you did it. I was active. Mm -hmm. But that's actually not what we're going to do here. We are going to do passive range of motion because that's what our care plan tells us to do. Passive range of motion means I'm going to do the work on the patient. They're not going to do it themselves. So we just did flexion extension. In fact, I told you to extend your arm above your head like you're asking a question. Flexing is bringing it back down. It's two sides to the same exercise. Up and then back down. Abduction, adduction is a side to side movement. So when you abduct a child, don't do that, that's bad. But when you abduct a child, you take it away from its family. When you abduct an extremity, you take it away from its family. 
So this is a side to side movement. This actually is different from this one. It works different muscles. Good? Good. And then we have rotation. Now rotation, there's only one because you always end where you start. It's an around motion. Not all joints can be rotated. Try to rotate an elbow, you will break it. <laughs> Not all joints can be rotated. Good? Mm -hmm. So when you're explaining this to the patient, and remember, we do have to explain things to our patients. I can't just go in and grab an arm and start moving it around. I mean, that arm might slap me. Right? So we have to explain this. When I explain these motions to the patient, I don't want to use these terms. Patient has no idea what flexion extension is any more than you do. What I would want to say is I'm going to extend your arm above your head like you're asking a question. Everybody knows what that motion is. I'm going to bring your arm out to the side like you're making a snow angel. Everybody knows what that is. I'm going to, to rotate your wrist like you're waving a magic wand. Everybody knows what that is, right? So what I want to do is put commonly um, used motions with these actions. That way my patient understands what we're doing. Good? Mm -hmm. So this hair plan tells us to do flexion extension, which is up and down. It tells us to do abduction, adduction, which is side to side. Mm -hmm. tells us to do three repetitions of each. We're going to put an opening in front of it. We're going to put a closing behind it. And that's our skill. Super easy, super quick. But remember that we're not trying to improve anything, right? We're mm -hmm. just trying to keep what the patient's got. So we have to listen to the patient. We want to watch for signs of pain. If my patient gets out to here and says, ow, then the next time I'm going to go below the ow and I'm going to let the nurse know, hey, I got to here and got ow. And the nurse can figure out what that means. So we don't we don't say things like no pain, no gain. <laughs> okay, that's not us. We don't like pain. We don't do pain. We are only going to go to the point of, of resistance or we're going to stop if we get pain. Good? Mm -hmm. Questions? Okay. So a couple of things with when we're doing range of motion, we want to lift from below. We've talked about this before. We want to make sure we're supporting at the joints and we're lifting from below, not from above. But we want to return to start. So a range of motion means we've got to go all the way back to our starting position. If I go up like this and then just come down a little, this is not a range of motion. When I go up, I've got to go all the way back to start. Nice short cut. We're going to support at two joints, and then we want to make sure we're monitoring for any pain. So what would be a sign of pain? Wincing. Wincing, grimacing, ow. That's always a sign of pain. But you can also have other things like resistance, stiffening up, pulling away, looking away. You want to be aware of those nonverbal cues as well. So watch for signs of pain because you've got a lot of patients that won't tell you about pain. They're stoic. They try to hide it. Okay, so um, somebody uh, come lay down over here in this bed and I will show you this skill. Okay, remember my care plan says left shoulder. So I've got to make sure that I am truly on the correct side. You 
you scoot down in the bed just a little bit? Thank you. Awesome. Okay. All right, so I'm going to simulate hand washing because this is not my first skill. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Okay. Fantastic. I need to do some exercises on your left arm. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to close your curtain, lock my hands, get my supplies. I'll be right back. I got my hands. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to do all the work. All you have to do is let me know if you can or it's not going to be needed. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is bring your arm up like you're asking a question and then all the way back down to the bed. I'll do the work. But you just let me know if you can do it. So I'm going to stretch your arm out. I'm going to support at the joints. We're going to go all the way up and all the way back down. Feel okay? Mm -hmm. Any pain? Okay. I'm going to do that again. We're going to go all the way up. And all the way back down. That's two. Let's do one more. All the way up. And all the way back down. Good? Mm -hmm. Any pain? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to bring your arm out to the side and back in like you're making a snowman. Okay. And then support at the joints. We're going to go oops, <laughs> all the way up. And back in, that's one, all the way up, and that's two, one more, anything? No, no, there we go. Are you comfortable? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No. Would you like a magazine before I leave? No, okay. Here's your call light. If you need anything at all, just press that red button. I'm going to go ahead and open your curtain. Wash my hands. Make any corrections. I'll probably read that care plan one more time to make sure I worked on the correct body uh, part and I did the correct exercises. And then I'll probably evaluate on the skill as well. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Any questions? All right, give me about four minutes. I'm going to print out the uh, test registration instructions. And we're going to talk about how to register for the test, the testing timeline, how the whole process works. And I'll give you your review sheet for today as well.
the people like to take it. Yes. Yeah. I don't actually use them on the Yeah. 
I do work at a village in Chicago Park for the time. And she does I have to work. She did get trained and certified to well, nine to like in food injections and things like that. So she um and she's not a team that's yet she got very medical certificate. So they um so and then the last day but yeah, so we were kind of influenced with the bike last year so But my uh, my background before going into
Okay, so the first thing that I need you to understand is that I have test registration instructions online for you. Go to fouryearcna.com under the testing tab, you'll see test registration instructions. This is going to be your new best friend. So you're going to have a million questions when you get home. I have done an actual test registration on the screen so you can see it. And then I have step by step follow along directions as well. Okay, mm -hmm. so you want to know that that is there for you. It's also listed here on this page. This is our roadmap. We're going to go over this first, but um, it also tells you about the um, test registration instructions. So this is the page we're going to go through. This tells us how we're going to get from here to there. Um, if you don't have a background check already on file, and by background check, I mean a level two with photo for health care. If you had it done for concealed carry, it doesn't, it doesn't count. If you had it done for foster care, it doesn't count. If you had it done for education, it doesn't count. It has to be for health care for them to be able to pull it. So level two background check for health care with a photo. If you've got one, you can skip step one. If you're not sure, then you need to go get a background check. And step one tells you how to do that. Here um, in our area, we use Deontis, which is that first link there. Just type that into your browser, go to Deontis, register for uh, an appointment for a background check. They do same day appointments, but you need a code when you register. That code is right there in the gray box, EDOH0380Z. You have to have that code for it to be routed to the right place, okay? What that does is it sends that background check to a specific filing cabinet. When you register for the test, they go to that filing cabinet and look for your background check. They don't go to any other filing cabinets, just that one. If your background check isn't there, your application stops. It doesn't do anything else. It stops. So make sure you have a background check. 24 hours after you go do your background check, you can submit your application. Now I've given you the paper application, which we're gonna go over together right now, but the fastest way is to register online. The online registration is this same paper application, just online. So everything that we're going to talk about now will be relevant if you're going to do an online application. It's not just a matter of putting your name, address, and telephone number in. This is an extensive application. As you can see, it's seven pages long. So we have to go through that. After you submit your application, uh, one to three days later, you're going to get an email from Prometric. As long as that email says, complete and pending approval, you don't have to do anything else. But if you're missing your payment, like your payment didn't go through, it'll say incomplete. You'll have to call them. If it says record not found under FBI background status, it means that your level two background was not in that filing cabinet. They didn't find it. You have to go get one. Got it? Okay. So one to three days after you submit your application, you're going to get a response from them. Read the response to make sure it's complete and pending approval. As long as it says pending approval and complete, seven to 10 days later, you're gonna get another email with your test date. You do not get to choose your test date. They test seven days a week. So you might end up with a Sunday appointment. The only days that they take off are major holidays, like Good Friday, they don't take off. Easter, they do. Um, they only take off, I think it's seven major holidays. That's it. Other than that, they test. You cannot choose your testing date. But when they assign your testing date, let's say that you get a, um, a response. It sets your test date up as May 3rd. You absolutely know there's no way in, in the world that you can make May 3rd. You call them up and say, hey, that date doesn't work for me. When you do that, they will on the phone with you find a mutually agreeable date. 
but you have to do that right away. If you wait until May 2nd to call them up and say, I'm not available May 3rd, they're going to continue to charge you because there's no, they can't put anybody else in that spot. It's too late. So you're going to be out that money. If you call right away, as soon as you know that you can't make that date and they work with you on the phone, then they won't, they'll be able to put somebody else in that spot that you would have taken and they won't charge you for it. Good? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the, the timeline. So background check, submit your application. One to three days later, you'll get a response. Seven to 10 days later, you'll get your testing date. Let's go through the application. We're not going to do this together in class. You're going to fill this out on your own, but I am going to point out a couple of things. All right, the first page is pretty self-explanatory. Make sure that you're registering with your name. You need two forms of ID that match. If you go to the testing center and you do not have two forms of ID with the exact same name, they are not going to let you test. So one form of ID has to be a picture like a driver's license, social security, or I'm sorry, driver's license, passport, or military ID. Non-expired, by the way, that got one of my students the other day. Um, she says, I didn't realize my driver's license couldn't be expired. So non-expired. Um, and the second form of ID has to have a signature, like a social security card or a bank card or a library card, that type of thing. So you can read through page one. And the top of page three is just page two. It's just your demographic information. You can read through that as well. But let's go to the bottom of page two. If you have a felony in your background, if you have a felony, you need to see me after class. If you have no felonies, I need you to follow along with me on this. So check off no for one. So for number one, check no. Leave A, B, C, D, and E blank. Do not write anything in them. Just check no for number one. If you have no felonies in your background, check no for number two. Leave A and B blank on the next page. For three, four, and five, it's asking if you've ever been convicted of Medicaid fraud as a provider. So if you were a physician that defrauded Medicaid, you would be on a list. If you don't know what the list is, it doesn't apply to you. So three, four, and five have to do with Medicaid fraud as a provider. If you check no, make sure you're leaving the A's, B's, C's, and D's blank. Do not check any of those off. Disciplinary history, which is in the middle of page three, it's asking if you've ever been a medical provider of any sort that had your certification revoked or suspended. So if you've never had a medical certification anywhere, it's going to be no all the way down. Bottom section is criminal history, self-explanatory. Either you have one or you don't. The first question is asking if you have a criminal history. The second question asks if you've had any records sealed or expunged. Third question is a juvie record. Do you have a juvie record? Yes, they will find it. They will. Go ahead and go to page four. This one I cannot help you with. Read the questions and answer them. I'm not allowed to help you with the health history. And if you go to page five, I've already filled out a lot of this for you. So all of you are registering as E3 Challenger. You are not going to complete the training information. And you're going to be testing at a regional test site. So down here on the bottom of this page, the first page that we looked at, are the test sites for our area. We have one by the airport in Tampa. We have one in Ocala, and we have one in Tampa over by 75. 
So you'll pick the one that, that you want to go to, the closest one, you know, however you want to, uh, to schedule that. And you're going to put that code in the box on page five next to regional test site. So if you're testing in Tampa by the airport, which is our closest one, you would write T-A-M-A-I-R in that box. If you're doing this online, it's just a drop down and you're gonna select the one that's closest to you, okay? Now the bottom part is the exam fees. If English is not your first language, you may want the earphones for the test to read the question and the answer choices to you. So if English is not your first language or if you have reading difficulties, you may want um, the second option where it says clinical skills and written oral. If you don't want the computer to read the questions to you, check the first one. The written test can also be taken in Spanish for anybody whose Spanish is your primary language. That may be helpful to you as well. So you can check off the option that works for you. You're on page five. So this is where you get to pick how you want to test. Do you want to test just the plain Jane test? Do you want the earphones to read the, the questions to you? Do you want the test, the written test in Spanish? Do you want the written test in Spanish with earphones in Spanish? So those are the four options that you have. You have to pick one of them. And out to the side, you'll write 155 for the choice that you're making. Page six is asking you for an affidavit. And page six is having you check a box that says that you have received and read this notice, these two pages. They're always up here. You can take them down and read them. This is their privacy policy. It tells you how they're gonna use your personal information to clear you for testing. So it's a, it's a legal form. So you wanna check the yes box that you have received and read, that uh, notification, like I said, it's up here. You can also print it online if you wish. And then below that are just some bullet points that you need to read, sign, and date. Now at the bottom of the page, it says, if you do not receive your emailed authorization to test, that's what ATP stands for, within 10 to 14 business days, Contact Prometric. Notice they don't give you a phone number. Hmm. Hey, call us. <laughs> but we're not going to tell you how. This page right here, if you look at the bottom of the third column right there, that is Prometric's phone number. So if you do not get your authorization for the test within 14 business days, you need to call Prometric using that number. You may need to be persistent and you may need to talk to a supervisor when you call Prometric. A lot of times they'll give you an answer that doesn't match this. They'll say it can take up to 180 days or something like that. That's not what this says. So if you get that answer, just ask to speak to your supervisor. Okay. And then the last page is your payment page. If you're registering online, you'll input your payment information right online, debit or credit card. If you're gonna mail your application in, then you would fill this out with the appropriate payment information. The address to mail it to is at the bottom of page seven. Now, if you're mailing your application in, you need to add two to three weeks in processing. If you do the application online, if you do it today or tomorrow, you should be testing about three weeks after graduation. Normally it's one to two, but this is the busy season because all the high schools and colleges are all graduating and all of those people have to test. So between mid-April and mid-June is busy season. It takes a little bit longer to get scheduled to test. Okay, good? Questions? Remember, I have detailed test registration instructions on the website under the testing tab. 
If you run into trouble, bring your application back to me on Monday and I'll help you individually. That is the So, you want to get So, you're going to turn to Oh, hold on. 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 Oh, when you say uh, when in English you're not, not learning the first language, so right here, so I say I can do the clinical scale of the English, and I can do this written in Spanish. Um, so you have to pick one of these. So if you want the written in Spanish, that's fine, but do you want the earphones in Spanish too? So this one is no earphones, this one is earphones. So you only pick one. You have to pick one of those. See you Monday. Have a great weekend. Okay, guys. I don't see any questions for YouTube, so I will see you guys on Monday. We have a live question and answer session tomorrow at 3 p.m. Feel free to join us. Until next time, happy caregiving. Bye. <laughs> So we...